they call it a time and motion study, <laughs> which which is a poo joke, obviously. Like it's, a, it's, a to- it's toilet humour. But if you know anything about Taylorism, it's actually a joke about the foundations of management theory. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Flux. I'm Ben McKenzie. Welcome to Pratt Chat, the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast. Each month, we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books with a special guest. This month, we're reading Making Money because it just makes sense. (laughs) And our returning guest is writer and journalist Stephanie Convery. Welcome back, Steph. Thank you for having me. We were just saying before we started that it seems now we have a tradition that every 40 episodes or so, we have to get you back on. Um, I, so welcome. I am totally okay with that tradition. Um, talking about Terry Pratchett novels is uh, joy. And talking about it with you guys who know so much about them and, and spend so much time with them is even better. I'm so glad we could have you back. <laughs> yeah, it's an absolute delight. And I think, you know, we often try to think of who's got some relevant expertise or knowledge outside of Pratchett that will help us sort of understand this book and, and what it's about more. And when we had you last on, you know, it was, it was your work as a journalist generally when we were reading The Truth. Uh, but you've changed positions now at The Guardian. You're now the inequality reporter at The Guardian, which I think seems very appropriate for this book. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm doing um, a lot of reporting on wealth inequity, for one thing, the different ways that inequity kind of manifests for people. But obviously, a, a lot of that comes down to money, who has money and who has power. Um, and money and power are so tightly intertwined, as we know, and as Terry Pratchett obviously knows and likes to explore in more than one way in his books. Yeah, so I mean, it's ex- I was actually thinking, why why did they bring me on this one? What, what what am I bringing to this particular economics? I don't know. And then I was thinking about it, and like, yes, Steph, Steph, you you do have a you do think about that a lot. Yeah. yeah. And your golden suit. And my golden suit. Yeah, of course, I have three yeah. in my wardrobe. <laughs> Um, glad you remembered that. Um, yeah. But, mm-hmm. but which hat do you have? That's the question. I, I just prefer mm. a straw hat, honestly. Keeps mm. the sun off, you know. It's it's golden, but it's a different kind of golden. Yeah. Mm. Representative okay. of the labour oh, yeah. that went into the suits. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's go with that. <laughs> mm. That's interesting. It's often remarked upon that in fantasy, we're very good at imagining things like dragons and magic and elves and, and golems in this book. Uh, but we're not very good at imagining a world where there's not money or wealth and equity or classism or sexism or racism, et cetera. Like those things always seem to factor in. And and partly that's because we use fantasy as a, a more distant mirror to look at those things. But I do wonder I wonder I wonder if that's missing a trick, you know? If if we didn't if we had more fantasy that imagined those sorts of worlds without those things, would we find it easier to imagine our way out of the current capitalist nightmare that we live in? If you look back like a hundred years ago when people were pushing back against capitalism and the introduction of capitalism, there was so much more utopian fiction and like utopian kind mm. of um, thinking. I mean, I was thinking of the novels of um, the terrible in some ways of um, William Morris, right? This sort of, this very, it's almost like medievalism, but it's, it's like a projection of a future where things are simpler and the capitalist scourge is not there in the same way, you know? And I do actually think that that it's a manifest the fact that we don't have utopian fiction or utopian stories in the way that we used to is a manifestation of late capitalism. I think we have like, been so embedded in this for so long that we just we just can't think our way out of it and that's part of the challenge I think for progressive people is to think outside that like what is a world without this like how do we move forward rather than back? Because there's a real Scooby-Doo mask thing to it now as well, where anything that starts off as a book that seems like it's a utopia, secretly it's a massive dystopia and everything is much worse than it is here. Like, it's just, you know. Yeah, that's definitely the YA trope, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, we've gone really off topic and we've got a long book to discuss. Right, let's get into the book. We can begin with a reading of 
the blurb. I'm going to do the short blurb because I've got the nice collector's library edition. Oh, that's beautiful. It has a, just a short blurb on the back. The bank is facing a crisis and it's time for a change of management. It's a job for life. But as conman Moist von Lipwig is learning, the life is not necessarily for long. It's very short, these these collector's editions, because they're they, they usually replicate part of the illustration on the back, so there's not a huge amount of room for <laughs> for the blurb. But uh I think that does the job. I would like to flag in and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, in my longer blurb it has a line which will flash forward, it says the chief cashier is almost certainly a vampire and then it says other stuff, but I'm like why would you put a major plot point that's sort of a, like a spoiler of an almost thing in the blurb? Like, just just don't. Yeah. I'm not going to say what happens because we'll get into that, but it just feels like that doesn't need to be there. In my edition, like, the hints that there's something weird about Mr. Bent start pretty early on. They're like, they're in the first chapter and they're like 40 pages in. So, I, I don't think that that's going quite specific. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have gone that far. That's why I mean, like, there's something off about the chief cashier would be fine, but I feel like you're supposed to feel like you yourself have come to the conclusion that he's a vampire and then they pull the the rug out from you. So I feel like it Mm. robs you of a step of that journey Mm. of storytelling. I do like that in one of the blurbs, there's a bit where it says, there's a nameless thing in the basement referring to the (laughs) glooper. And I'm like, oh, that's a, that's good. It, there's not that eldritch horror element to the glooper that that kind of suggests, but there is the sort of, you know, the hammer horror mad scientist stuff going on there, which is a delight as always. Hmm. And it's always nice to have an eagle. I actually feel like it's one of those books where it's better if you don't read the blurb. Mm. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. if, you're, if you're going to a Terry Pratchett <laughs> book and somebody has told you to read that one, reading the blurb is not going to really tell you very much about what this book is about, I don't think. In some ways, like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I actually, I don't think I've ever read a blurb that I felt was quite satisfying mm. or quite, like, did the right thing for me in terms of getting me into the book. It is a very difficult thing to do, writing a blurb, but. Yeah. I feel like this one is a little bit misleading. I've got the long one, I think, the one that you were just mentioning um, about the vampire in the cellar and, sorry, the chief cashier being the vampire and there's something strange in the cellar. Mm. And I just don't feel like it really captures what the book is. No. No, that's fair. And I don't know if it's possible to capture what the book is, like, because he does so many different things, and yet it's a complete, like, it, it stands alone if you really need it to. Like, you could jump into Discord in this book, like, you would be missing a bit of context, but you absolutely could just be like, this is my first one, and I've walked away satisfied that I've read a complete novel. So, hmm. yeah, why is a blurb so challenging? I always feel like the blurbs are for people who don't really know Terry Pratchett's work. Right, because if you know mm. who Terry Pratchett is, and you're you're just going to get it because his name is on the cover. You're not going to pick up the blurb and go, "What's this one about? Do I want to read it?" <laughs> like you, it's you know, you just want some context. Like, what what favorite characters do I think are going to appear? And you just see Moise von Lipwig's name there, and you're like, "Great, I loved him. He was great. I'm glad he's back." Because uh, mm. this was his you know second appearance. I think he does make a cameo in one of the books between Going Postal and this, but there's not that many books between them. I think it's only like two or three. So, yeah, he was he's clearly established himself as a favorite knowing moist though he could be in literally every discworld book and we just wouldn't notice him <laughs> he's in disguise yeah he's he's the little guy who's like swindling the the minor character in the in the tavern in Uberworld or whatever oh, exactly this is probably more one for the listeners because this is going to take more time thinking than we we have because we've only just thought of this but now i want us to all nominate and listen i want you to do this you can you can reply this on social media the hashtag for this episode is pratchat 80 but i want you to nominate minor characters from other discworld books that could be moist von lipwig in one of his various con man disguises that would be great. Actually, I can think of one. He could be the Pied Piper from The Amazing Maurice, except he's a real Pied Piper. He's not a con man. So, no, that doesn't work. But that was my first instance. But, but you know. The potential is there. And as a group, we can make this happen. We can find where he is in the entire series. So, I reckon this is a good project. Totally. Speaking of um, projects that are not not good, what's Moist von Lipwick up to at the beginning of this book? Yeah, we the, the book starts with just setting the pieces on the table, so to speak, so that we know the state of play, because we haven't seen these characters for a little while. So kind of echoing the prologue to uh, Going Postal, there's this sort of nice thing about golems underground somewhere. We don't really know where they are or what they're doing, but they send some sort of message. Then we see Adorabel Deerheart. <laughs> Still one of the greatest character names ever. 
particularly when you get to know the character a bit better. But she is leasing a, a patch of land from the dwarfs uh, somewhere this side of Chimeria, which I love. It's a very Discworld take on um, Samiria, the, the name of the land in the Conan stories. But this is an imaginary land, so it's called Chimeria. But she's leasing it for the Golem Trust and won't say why. Makes an agreement that she's not going to take anything precious like gold or minerals or stuff like out of that. And the dwarfs are pretty sure there's nothing there. It's all very mysterious. She's clearly digging something up. And I think from the context, I think we, we assume, well, there's golems underground and she works for the golem. She's clearly going to look for these golems. But what's their deal? Why are they there? And then we see Moist, um, who is so bored with his life going really well at the post office that he's climbing up the outside of the building at night time. But we don't know at first that it's him. Like, we know it's him, but they don't sort of... He's just some guy climbing outside a building for a while, which I thought was nicely done. I realized when I was rereading this that there's so many things from this book that have just sunk into my brain at some level that just come straight back to the surface going through these pages. Like, I I don't think I've read it since it first came out, even though I absolutely love it. And the one thing I remember and think about quite regularly is that line about noises, about how there's like loud noises and public noises that you don't worry about, but it's the little noises, like a little thing clacking onto the floor that that gets everyone sort of hackles up. And I that's something I've, I think about at least once a week, I reckon, since I first read that. It is very good. Yeah, I really like that as well. I thought that I also thought that this introduction was quite well done because I ha- also haven't read it for many years, this book. And also, I don't remember the last time I read Going Postal either. It's a little bit further on that you kind of get the context of Moist again. But I didn't feel like I needed to go back and read all of that to remember who Moist was, what he'd been doing previously and how he got there because it was all kind of drip fed really seamlessly, I felt. But at this opening, I didn't realize it was him initially because I hadn't been here for a while and I was like, but you could tell something was quite, something was a little bit off in that beautiful way that Terry Pratchett does. It's just this subtle little, subtle little hints that, that there's something that you can't see yet, but you will, and it'll turn this thing on its head. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of great plot seeds sown in this first chapter. I really like that. And there's, uh, I mean, we've got Moist is an adrenaline junkie, right? Like he, he needs the thrill of the chase. He needs the fear of being caught to feel alive. And now that he's no longer a con man, He's not getting it. And also, he's also, the post office is kind of a solved problem. Like, it's just running nicely. No one needs him to do anything outlandish and solve problems. And this is like a recurring theme that Vetinari in particular picks up on. And we find out things like, you know, he's been uh, buying lockpicks <laughs> and a blackjack and carrying them around with him, but not really using them, but just having them makes him feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing something illicit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, stuff like that. But this is like the most extreme example where he's, you know, breaking into his own building uh, and nearly getting caught and then having to, you know, con his way out of it by pretending that maybe he's got a mistress in a very subtle way. I'm like, oh, I don't know. That's that's a brave thing to do, uh, <laughs> Moist. Like, if that gets back to Adora Bell, you will be in a lot of trouble. But he keeps trying to tell her what he's like. He'd be like, oh, no, I did it for this reason. She wouldn't think for a second that he had a mistress. Like, she wouldn't believe it. That's true. He wouldn't dare. But she might not appreciate other people thinking that he does. Mm. There's that great line, though, where Topsy is like, what does your girlfriend think of you? And he's like, or, or some, I can't remember the exact phrasing, mm. but the, the voice is like, I keep trying to tell her. <laughs> and she won't, you know, she doesn't, mm. she doesn't believe oh, she won't accept it or she, do- or she does accept it, I think, is the thing, right? She accepts it. She knows exactly what it's like. And she also thinks, well, I know you better than you know yourself, really. That's true. Although I do like, there is another, and we'll get to that scene, but there's another layer to that where Topsy says, after he, he says that, she says, people like us always keep at least one inner self for inquisitive visitors, don't we? <laughs> so she's suggesting that whatever inner self he's shown to her, he hasn't really shown her the real deep, true person who he is inside, which I don't think is true. I think he does get to that stage in going postal, but I, I get where she's coming from. I think he shows that curated inner self and she sees the real one underneath it and he doesn't understand that. Mm. Yeah, okay. Anyway, he nearly gets caught and then he sort of settles down and he has breakfast. I think this is where we first meet Gladys. Oh, it might be it might be in a later scene. Um <laughs> Although we first met Gladys in in Going Postal, but we get introduced the idea that one of the golems who works for the post office was cleaning out the bathrooms in Going Postal. And one of the women there, the elderly lady, Mrs. McElariot, insisted that it was not okay for a um, a man to be cleaning the women's bathrooms. And they're like, it's not a man, it's a golem. But she was insistent. 
So they um, put a dress on a golem and called it Gladys. And now this golem has started to adopt stereotypically feminine traits, shall we say, is performing gender. I think it's- Based on her reading material. The way they talk about gender in, in terms of Gladys is very interesting from a 2024 perspective from a book written in 2007. Well, because it is kind of like the 50s and the 60s in Moist World a little bit as well. And so, like, they talk about the women at the counter sort of giving her presumably these homemaker magazines and kind of things. And she takes everything very literally. So, she reads, this is how a young woman comports herself. This is all the things she does. She'll make her man a sandwich. She'll do his ironing. She'll do all this stuff. And it's a good journey across the book of how the reading material provided to Gladys influences her behavior because she takes everything from it on board and then just rejects what's come before. And I'm, I'm not sure if by the end of it, she's sort of compiled lots of different things together and come to her own conclusion, or she's still working off the one that she's most recently read. It's an interesting literal manifestation of the socialization of gender, like, mm. like gender as a social construct, right? So you've got this literal lump of clay ungendered that is then given input like material, like it takes, it sort of absorbs that and then performs the gender that has been, that has been kind of shown to them. Um, I actually think it's really a really neat kind of comment, a subtle one. Mm. In, well, subtle, is it mm. subtle? I don't know. Sometimes I think Terry Pratchett is both subtle and a sledgehammer, yeah. but. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of both. <laughs> like Gladys. <laughs> yeah, like Gladys, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a deliberate comment on how gender is constructed. Mm. In a beautiful kind of way. Yeah. It's also the arbitrariness of it, right? Like, these are things that are told to her by a magazine. They seem very silly when she actually starts to perform them. At the same time, they're very kind of deeply held by people, and that has repercussions. Mm. And I love that there's several layers to it, like with most things that, you know, you read in Pratchett. Because there's the layer where when people talk about Gladys, there's these repeated sort of motive of, of people saying how can a golem be a she? And there's one point where Moist says to someone, ah, the correct answer to that is, how can a golem be a he? You know, where are these conventions coming from? Why are we assuming male as the default for creatures that clearly are without gender? But then there's also the layer of that social construct of gender and how we're all informed by it, like you were talking about, Steph. And then there's also the layer of golems believing words are literal truth and very important because they literally are brought to life by words written on a piece of paper and put in their head. There's that great line from Going Post, or actually it's from Feet of Clay, isn't it? The words in the heart cannot be taken, where the golems, when they buy themselves, you know, they they don't need the words in their head anymore. That's kind of beautiful. And then that also translates into, in the disc world, the golems are very much an analog for robots and artificial intelligence and how Mm. they interpret instructions. And there's a great scene later on in the book where Moist has to get Gladys to do something, and he's kind of exploiting the latest set of rules that she has ingested about etiquette. It's great. And it's very, it's like something from a Star Trek episode, actually, where, you know, they encounter some robot and they have to use its own logic against it to stop it from doing something. It's great. There's so much stuff going on just with that one character. It's brilliant. Did anyone else really want to try one of those horrible sandwiches? I know that that is not the message (laughs) of the Gladys character, but I was like, I really just would, I'm so curious about one of these like ham smashed sandwiches. And also wouldn't hate just being able to iron something by pushing it. My hand against against the wall because I simply do not iron things. I just I just do not. I unless I'm sewing something, I do not iron clothes. I buy clothes that do not need to be ironed. But that would be convenient sometimes when you're trying to like iron a dress by just hanging it in the shower near you and hoping the steam <laughs> fixes it. The sandwiches reminded me of the ones that you would often find squashed in the bottom of your school bag. Mm-hmm. Like, that's <laughs> that's what I thought of when <laughs> when Gladys' sandwiches came out. It was like, oh. Yeah, or when you've stuffed too much stuff into your lunchbox and so the sandwich at the bottom of the lunchbox is squashed because there's like an apple and a muesli bar and a, something else on top of it and it's all, you know, jiggled around and just gotten squashed flat. Yeah. You could roll it into a sort of like sandwich like roll. If it's so so flat, perhaps that'd be worse. It's so dense. I remember distinctly thinking that if you squashed bread flat, it became sweeter. And I think there is some chemistry behind that that might make that slightly true. (laughs) So I don't know. I'll have to look that up now. I think you just have to experiment. Yeah. But look, apart from this excitement, as Moist gets back to his normal day and he's eating his Gladys made breakfast, he sees the morning paper. And this is another one of the plot seeds. He is horrified for a moment to realize that there's a fairly clear photograph of his face, although he always tries to move at the last minute so it's not perfectly clear. 
um, on the front cover of the uh, Ankh-Morpork Pork Times. Because, you know, even though he has a very forgettable face, as we're reminded many times, and this is why, you know, subtle disguises work especially well for him, because he's got a very generic <laughs> face, he's not thrilled about potentially thousands of people seeing his face and maybe someone recognizing, hey, isn't that the guy who conned me out of a hundred gold pieces for a diamond ring that was worthless that time? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah, he's a bit worried about that. And he also lets Tiddles in. That's the one thing I wanted to mention from this scene as well, like the post office cat, who was one of my favorite parts of going postal. It was a great way of showing how humdrum and routine his life has become because an alarm goes off on his desk. He opens the door. The post office cat comes in, does his round and goes back out again. And he sort of sits there being like, this is my life now. I used to have excitement and now I have an alarm to let a cat do its thing because otherwise he would sadly be headbutting the door for like the rest of the day. Oh, yeah. And I can't really deal with that. And then he sets the alarm for the next day, even though he's like, this is sad and I hate it. I thought that was a really good way of showing that while also bringing back a beloved character yeah. for like a cameo, basically a cat, cat meow. Yeah. You know, this makes me worried now because he does spend most of the book and the book doesn't take place over that long a period of time. Like it's less than a week. Like it's a few days really, hmm. but he spends most of that time living at the bank. So, who's opening the door for Tiddles? Oh, no. Maybe he leaves the door open. That would be good. Gladys? No, but Gladys comes to the bank, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, new headcanon. Tiddles spends the whole book just trying to get into that (laughs) room. Oh, no. (laughs) Why don't they just install a cat flap? Like, come on. Yeah, I mean. But doesn't he have to move the chair? Like, she has to kind of, Tiddles has to kind of go in this particular routine and. And Moist has to move the chair out of her way. Is her? Is it her? I can't remember. I think it might be. Gendered cat. Ooh, Uh, yeah. But yeah, Tiddles, it's- Them. They're like a a character in a video game. (laughs) They have a set path. (laughs) And if you've randomly put stuff in their way, they'll just keep walking into it. There's a few video game references in this book. I think that is definitely meant to be one. But that's a great question. What's happening to Tiddles while his excitement is going down? I don't know. Listener, we'd love your theories. Do they assign a specific golem? I don't know. Someone has to be doing his paperwork. In the film version in my head of Making Money, there's just a little scene later when, when Moist at the bank somewhere in a perfect spot where you just see Tiddles like batting oh. batting their head against the wall. It's just a, like <laughs> the, the post office is, <laughs> is fine except for Tiddles. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine the scene actually. There'd be like a line of dialogue where someone says, well, what about the post office? He's like, the post office is fine. And he leaves his office in the bank and his organizer, <laughs> which he's brought with him, goes off. And then we just see a one second cut scene of Tiddles banging into a chair yes, or something. It's beautiful. Yeah. There we go. Nice. The post office runs itself, I think, is, is what. Yeah. That's what it's like. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, but that brings us to the job offer because Moist is summoned mm. by the patrician to the palace, and he offers him a new job as Master of the Royal Mint, which also involves having a senior post at the Royal Bank of Ankh-Morpork, because the previous owner has died, the previous chairman has also died, but there is a current chairman who's the wife of the previous chairman, and he wants him to take this job request seriously. He's not really into it, but they go and see the bank, and this is where we introduce to many of the major characters including Mr. Bent, Mavolio Bent, what a great name, uh, who is the chief cashier, Mm. the aforementioned, almost certainly a vampire. (laughs) And uh, look, the clues that something is up with him start very early on. One of the questions we've Mm. got, which I think we'll answer as we keep going, is what did we think was going on with Mr. Bent when we were reading it? First of all, it's very unusual for him to be late. He's very punctual. He always knows what time it is, and he's very good with numbers. But also when he walks in, Part of the way he's described is the way he walks, where he lifts up his whole feet every time he takes a step, Mm. almost as if he's expecting his his feet to be heavier and bigger than they are. And I was just imagining like Herman Munster style, Frankenstein's monster kind of character who's walking in that very, I'm wearing these big heavy boots to make me look bigger than I am kind of deal. The description there is also beautiful. It's like, perhaps he wanted to show them off because he walked like a dressage horse. Yes. Like... (laughs) But I have to say, when I first, I, I think I skipped the feet part when I first read this. Mm. Um, and I, I, but I did get the the kind of a couple of the hints that he might be a vampire. But it never kind of stuck. And I can't, and I can't decide if it was because I had read it before and I knew that he wasn't a vampire, and I was just sort of letting that that memory was just sort of slowly coming up, or if it was just if it was because that would just be too easy. Mm. I don't know. Mm. And they've already got vampires. We 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 got them. 
Yeah. Um, but the, th- the thing that happened this time around, I can't remember what I thought the first time I read it. Like, I, that memory is completely gone. But this time around, as soon as they mentioned the feet, my brain went, that's it. And I remembered immediately what he actually was. So after that, like, it was sort of moot. Yeah, I didn't. I went through a few different things. I never thought vampire, although the, the whole thing with being good with numbers, I mean, that is one of the many different vampire myths is that one of them is about counting. You know, one of the ways you stop a vampire is you spill a I bunch of rice on that. the ground. They have to count all the grains. Is that why Sesame Street has the count who counts? Yeah. Is that like they're supposed to be good with numbers? I never knew that. I didn't I, know that either. I yeah, thought yeah, it was yeah. a pun. <laughs> I just thought I it mean, was a pun. it's also a pun, <laughs> but that is also a thing. But it's more a sort of a... I forgot what they're called, but you know the Chinese hopping vampires? I think it's more them rather than Eastern European vampire myths. I think that's where it comes yeah, from. Was, I can't remember this being like, I can't remember Dracula no. kind of mm. being good with numbers, but I mean, <laughs> no, there were vampires in other, in other cultures too. Yeah, so. and Dracula, Dracula's so yeah, weird true. because when Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, he kind of just went through all of the different sort of vampire myths of Europe and just stole bits from everywhere. So that's why Dracula's got so many weird things going on. So like he can turn into mist, he can turn into a bat, he can turn into wolves, he can mesmerize people, he has to sleep in dirt, he can only be killed by sunlight and a stake through the heart, and he doesn't like garlic, and this, and that, and this. It's because he's just compiled this, all these things into one. None of the myths were that complicated. <laughs> Is it because of that, or is it because of that plus the easy access to cocaine in, like, Victorian <laughs> era? I mean, I think the two things go hand in hand, surely. Like, if you look at his other books, but anyway. Yeah. But I will say that uh, what I thought, not at this early stage with Mr. Bent, but once we see his room and they mention the wardrobe, I thought, oh, he's like a boogeyman mm. or something. Like, he used to live in that wardrobe. Because I couldn't remember. I didn't remember or what he sleeps in the real it. deal was. Does it, you definitely get the sense, though, that whatever he is, he's repressing some deep trauma. Mm. Like, that comes out really, really early. Um, I think maybe it's around the part where he starts sort of saying, I, I don't find anything funny. Oh, yeah. Nothing is funny. I have a syndrome where nothing is funny and I'm happy. You, like, you know, you know. I think was part of, like, part of Pratchett's inherent distrust of anyone in a suit. Mm. Like, anybody who feels, like, comfortable. In, like, there's always something slightly off about his characters when they're when they're suited up like that. And I feel like he's sort of really, like, leaned into that with the character of Ben, particularly in the early pages. Yeah. Because the suit is holding something in. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know that he does describe it. I don't think he's got an ill-fitting suit, but I did, because I had that sort of, you know, Herman Munster kind of image in my head, I did imagine him kind of like clomping around and maybe his suit's slightly too small for him. But I don't think that's actually part of the description that's given. No, I always imagined him impeccably dressed, like everything is perfect, not a speck of dust. Everything is tailored perfectly. Not one thing out of place. I imagine him wearing a little bow tie, though. He does have a penguin quality to him. But, like, a very tasteful black one. I don't think I imagined a bow tie. I think it was a tie. I think it was, like, very precise everything. Yeah, like you were saying, it's very precise. Mm. Symmetrical one. Like it's like a double Windsor. Yeah. Um, but Ben also sort of, when he introduced his, I think one of my favorite bits is that one of the first things he says to Moist is, oh yes, the inventor of the unsecured one penny note. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I thought was a bit weird also because like he says that as if paper money is just a thing that people understand, but have decided against using. Whereas later in the book, as, as Moist and spoiler alert, invents paper money for Ank Morpork, it, it feels more like no one's ever thought of doing this, like as a, as a form of currency. Certainly not used in the same way as coins, like rather than some sort of like a personal check or promissory note, which is a bit different because it's specifically or a single transaction between two parties. So I thought that was a, there's a little bit of tension in, in the way he's writing about money in this book where in order to make some of the jokes work, there needs to be a familiarity with our monetary system, but then he's also presenting it as something new and novel in the disc world. So it's a, there's a, there's a, I thought there was a little interesting tension there, but it didn't spoil anything. It just was slightly weird. The energy of that line to me was that Bent has been going off in his group chat about this thing for like months and finally he's got his opportunity to say it to him as though everyone else understands. Like that was the, how it kind of felt. Like he just sort of has a rant all the time mm-hmm. and then, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think Ben has a group chat because I don't think <laughs> Ben has friends like that. But I, but I, th- I sort of felt like this was, this was him seeing what the, the great unwashed were doing with stamps and turning them into currency and, 
and looking down his nose at them because gold obviously is mm. the only, you know, real form of value here and sort of saying, well, what the plebs do, like that's wrong. And I'm, and, and I don't think we should enable that, but you know, and you are, you Moist, you are the, you are the creator of that wrong, wrong system. Mm. Um, and I'm going to sort of show you that I think that this is wrong. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, because he does, I mean, very quickly we find out how deeply he believes in the value of gold at the start of the second chapter, where he takes Moist on a tour of the bank and the mint, starting with the gold in the vault, which they just look at through a little latch in the vault door, and there's not that much of it. Moist is a bit like, there's not that much in there. He's like, yeah, that's plenty though, that's enough. And he talks about how gold is like the one true thing, and it's how you establish the value of a dollar And it's not the point that the actual coins are not made of gold. The point is that they are backed by this idea of gold and how valuable gold is. He really has fully bought into that. And to the point where later in the book, you know, he talks about it as the one uncorruptible metal that is unsullied by time, you know, because he he refuses the idea of switching to a silver standard because silver tarnishes. And you're like, okay, all right, mate, settle down. (laughs) Actually, I did have a moment where I was like, is there a way for a human to be a dragon in this series? There was like Smaug energy. So I was like, could that be? That's the only thing. I remember thinking maybe he was a dragon, but yeah, yeah, we have dragons, so I don't think that's possible. That's pretty cool. I didn't think of that, but now I'm. That's my alternate explanation. <laughs> That'll be so good. Because he just wants to climb on top of it and just be like, "These are mine." He obviously wouldn't, because he'd be for reasons that become clear later. He would be too ashamed to climb on top of that pile of gold. But then they go to the mint. I love the description of the mint. It's this big boxy building, but it's got like a big round thing sticking out the top that looks like, as Moist immediately says, it looks like a penny stuck in a slot. It turns out to be a giant treadmill that powers the place, although we, I don't think we ever really see it in use. No. Yeah. What a weird. It's cool. I, I kind of like that idea. And when he later on in the book, much later, he has the idea to make money boxes that look like it. I'm like, yeah, I used to have a money box that was meant to look like a bank. I guess that's still a thing, or was. I have a money box that literally looks like a bank. Like, it's like literally like a bank in Hong Kong, and you put the money in the top. It's, yeah, mm. it's pretty good. My, one of my favourite lines in the book um, was, it would be hard to imagine an uglier building that hadn't won a major architectural yes. award. It's just like, <laughs> beautiful. Too like, real. When I, when I was an undergrad at the University of Melbourne, the the joke always on campus was that the architecture building was the ugliest building on campus. And indeed, it has, since I was there, been demolished and replaced entirely. And the, the new one is nicer. <laughs> but yeah, the old one was no good. Could it be a way of encouraging people to do better, though? Like, potentially? <laughs> <laughs> An encouragement award for architecture. <laughs> no, as in you sort of go, oh, well, like, we're learning in this horrible building, but I will go out into the world and make better buildings. It could work. It could work. But if we go out of the world into the mint, this is where we have there's so much good stuff happens in the in there. Like we meet the men of the sheds. They've got all these different sheds for making all the different coins and doing all the different parts of the process. So it's like a production line, but like it's this weird mix of like industrial age and pre industrial age artisanship. It's great. It's such a weird I assume it's based on research for what mints used to be like, uh, because that's what Terry Pratchett's like. Just very cool. And then the discussions they have about how they make each of the coins and how long it takes and how much each coin costs and how some coins are worth less than they cost to make and other coins are worth a lot more than they cost to make. So it all kind of evens out. There's that great bit where he goes, and how do you get paid? And then there's this awkward (laughs) pause. And one of them says, this is a mint, sir. (laughs) And then he goes, what, you make your own pay? He's like, yeah. Although sometimes, you know, we have to go into overtime uh, and then we have to make extra money to pay ourselves for the overtime. And that takes more <laughs> time to do than we're making to pay. It's just a weird set of great silly jokes about it. It's so fun. It's also this beautiful, like, illustration of class difference, right? Like, you're in this place of extreme wealth in a lot of ways, but you also have these very poor men, mm. um, the men of the sheds, you know. And there's this beautiful little passage about... A sixteenth of a penny, one quarter of a farthing, what can you buy with that? It's like, well, you'd be amazed, sir, down some streets, a candle stub, a small potato that's only a little bit green. Like, this this great vast divide between people who are all in the same building. Hmm. I felt a bit weird about that. I like that line, and I, I really like that juxtaposition, but I also felt it, that Moist didn't belong on the other side of that line. You know, while he is a con man, 
The money to him was never the point. And even though he had like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars stashed away that he went and found in order to save the post office in his previous book, he's clearly also lived on the more desperate side as a con man running around and, and had times in his life where he's had no money. You're right. It's, it's perhaps um, not quite in tune with his character to have him sort of ignorant in that respect. But he is sort of in this in this part of the book, he is kind of humoring everyone he meets a little bit. That's true. Um, and I mean, it's, as when we get to the next lot of characters, um, I, that that comes out a bit more. I think. And I don't. I don't know that I felt it was jarring in, when I read it. Wait, 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 as when you say it now, it does sort of feel a little bit out of character. But um, he has also been the postmaster mm. for a while, right? Like, That's and, true. And, and he has been in a position of privilege for a while. And he's, he is kind of like slumming it by climbing up the walls of, of a night, you know. He's, he's trying to rediscover what he used to have because he's been so familiar with his other life for so long now. So I do think there's perhaps the potential that he's, he's actually mm. shifted class. Mm. I mean, he has quite literally. He's become, yeah. he's become the, the CEO essentially of a post office, right? So he's, he's gone from the bottom to the, all the way to the top and – as we know, class is structural and people's perception changes when you move through those layers. So mm. maybe it's an illustration of that. Like he's sort of forgotten. Part of him's kind of forgotten what it was like mm. to be scrounging on the street. And he does remember later on in the book, like when he renegotiates with the men of the sheds later, they ask him about the outworkers because one, one of the great gags here too is that they have people who work from home making money for the mint. <laughs> um, and remember, this is a book written in 2007. So working from home, unusual then, um, but- he does sort of turn that around because they ask about them because they make a lot of the smaller denominations. And uh, he says, I will, I will go to the map for the Elim or whatever the tiniest denomination is called. And he's clearly like, I get it. That's important. We're not going to get rid of that stuff. Don't worry. Because he does start, he starts the paper money at a dollar. Like all of the stuff that's less than a dollar is still coins. But yeah, great sequence. Lovely to meet those characters. And then he, they come back to the bank where they meet a few of the other characters. And then the best characters- Yes, that's true. Uh, the most importantly, meets um, Topsy Lavish, yes. who's the current chairman, um, <laughs> the widow of the previous chairman, whose pre-married surname was Turvey, so her name was Topsy Turvey. Hmm. Pratchett gets away with some names. It's a little bit obvious, that one, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But she gets some great lines and it's like with a wink that I can't even remember them, but like everything she says is salacious and it's not even like, yeah, sometimes it's not even double entendre. It's just straight, <laughs> straight up, just outrageous flirting. It's so good. And even Moist like recognizes her as, what does he call her? Like a, a classic type one feisty old lady. <laughs> I think he refers to her as, or Mark one. And, Mark one. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's exactly what she is. And she's so great, but she's, she's awesome. We love, we love Topsy. Um, and of course, Topsy's accompanied by one of the greatest <laughs> characters in all of Pratchett, Mr. Fusspot, who, who's drawn on the cover of uh, your editions. He's not on the cover of my edition, but uh, he's drawn on the cover of your editions as sort of a, a sort of a pug, I think. Yeah. He, he yeah. Looks like I go, yeah, a pug. A pug with bulging eyes and yeah. He, what, what a great dog. I love him so much. Um, I think the line, though, that sums him up for me is, Mr. Fusspot didn't care who he was or what he'd done. He just wanted to be friends. Mm. I'm like, yes, I have met dogs like this, and they are the greatest creatures on the earth. They're so good. I'm saying, I, I'm aware that I'm saying that while my cat is sleeping in the corner. I'm so glad he doesn't understand English. He'd be very upset with me. <laughs> but he's a bit like that, too. I think that's why I like my cat, because he's very friendly. He just wants to be friends with everybody, unless you're a cat. Mr. Fusspot's kind of the polar opposite or the good twin, I, in my mind, of Gaspo. Yeah. Mm. Um, who is just disgusting, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. The grossest dog. And this is, you know, this also very ugly and also of indeterminate breed. Um, but this one is ugly but interesting. <laughs> like, cute in a, in a kind of ugly but cute, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and friendly and, um, not, you know, swearing and, um, making dirty jokes. Although. And quite smart. Yeah, quite smart. Friendly to those who he trusts. Mm. Yeah, because he's shown to have that sort of intuition about who he trusts and who he doesn't. He responds as if speaking. Like, there's several moments in the book, particularly when he's hanging out with Moist, where Moist will say, isn't that right, Mr. Fusspot? And Mr. Fusspot goes, woof, woof. Like, you know, like he responds like he knows what's going on. And he just responds very appropriately most of the time. And then, of course, he's also very inappropriate later on to hilarious effects. But he's great. 
I mean, theoretically, he could be related to Gaspo because in his backstory, like his mother, a spoonhound, got out one night and Topsy says, oh, well, he's got lots of fathers. So cause that's why he's like, cause when she asked Moist what breed he is, he's like, uh, all of them. <laughs> so mm-hmm. maybe Gaspo is one of his fathers and maybe he can actually understand and sort of speak, but not fully. I don't know. I'm just like adding new canon through all of this. I also think he is, he is smart, but and without wanting to kind of jump ahead too much, he's smart. But when those later incidents happen, is he's kind of doing it innocently, I feel. Mm. I don't know. I never felt like he was being deliberately malicious with those later incidents. I thought it was kind of more like he didn't know what he had. It was just a... Yeah, it's just his favourite toy now. <laughs> yeah. A fun item. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't know. Uh, there's so many good moments with it, though. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Oh. Um, but, yeah, uh, Topsy, who is, yeah, the Mark One feisty old lady, immediately sees right through Moist facade, sends Mr. Bent off to take Mr. Fusspot for a walk so they can talk in private. And basically susses out his character, cuts him to the quick, more or less gets him to admit he's a bit of a con man, but then says, I like you, you should run this bank. And then is told to meet Hubert. So they go downstairs where again, and then there's sort of been seeds of this, like when he was in the waiting room in the bank at the start, he hears this gurgling and he's not really sure what that is. But then when they go into the basement, they meet Hubert and Hubert has a thing called the glooper. Um, Although I will just briefly mention on the way, Moist meets Miss Drapes, who's one of the other clerks at the bank, who clearly has it bad for Mr. Bent. And Mr. Bent is completely oblivious, but Moist sees this immediately. <laughs> and I was like, yep, that's a uh, con man senses tingling. It's like, I see this relationship that you do not understand. Okay, great. And then uh, moves on. But the glooper is so good. And this, we won't dwell on this because a lot of other people have talked about this, but it is based on a real device. It's based on a thing called the MONIAC or the uh, Philips device. MONIAC stands for Monetary National Income Analog Computer. So it was a water-based computer that was, yes, used for modeling the economics of an entire nation. And there were quite a few of them built. And the University of Melbourne actually has one. So there's one in Melbourne. I don't know if it's available to see. I think it has been on display in the past, but I'm, I'm not sure if it still is. So I'm definitely going to try and get to see it. I, I unfortunately did not have time to try and organize that before this episode. Are we going to go on a field trip like the three of us to go have a look at this thing? We could. We could go on an excursion yeah. and make a fun little bonus <laughs> episode of the podcast. Mm. But yeah, they're not. When you, If you look up a photo of them, they do not look like the glooper. So the glooper is like this. I imagine it kind of like one of those models that they build to demonstrate how floodplains work. Like it's massive like it takes up the whole space of the basement and it's all this impressive glassware filled with water that sort of moves around whereas if you see the picture of the moniac it's shaped a bit like an old-fashioned computer cabinet like it's a big white box with these quite boxy little vessels of liquid in them in various sizes so i'd love to see it in action but it's not as exciting as i imagine the glooper being which is this massive kind of mad collection of, of weird glassware because they have a, some beautiful lines about how, like, he doesn't understand how glass blowers could do stuff that intricately. Yeah. Because there's all sorts of whirls and little thin areas as well. So it's, to me, I, I struggle to imagine it other than, like, the classic alchemist in the 20s with all their glass, like, vials and stuff set up in their very nice, like, mid-century lab um, with different colored things going through it. Because it's an abstract way of putting something that's not, not really tangible into a tangible shape. So it's kind of, you know, like how you draw atoms. You It's not what it actually looks like, but it's a way of representing something that you can't see. I do think that is kind of underscored, that image, because that's how I imagined it too, this sort of amazing glass alchemist construction, yeah. is underscored by Igor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. right? like, I mean, he, <laughs> the quintessential kind of mad scientist, right? The, the bubbles and the sort of weird steaming things. 100% I think what Pratt is going for in this part. I mean, I, I was, I was so happy to read that, that the moniac is a thing. Like that, that the glue, but there is a real, real life yeah, glue, but yeah. I was so surprised that they were like so recently used too. And, it, but I also wondered if, if there was something in the fact that moniac is only one letter different to maniac. maniac yeah. And, and the person, the person we have constructing it has a, a little problem with um, the air in the cellar and um, <laughs> mm-hmm. sort of like tendency to start laughing uncontrollably. Yeah. Um, it's quite a, um, a subtle, well, it's just a subtle, subtle and a sledgehammer at the same time, right? If you didn't know anything about the moniac, where would that joke come from? But um, yeah. beautiful. I loved yeah. it. 
Yeah, I love it too. And I, I quite like Hubert. I mean, there's this weird section where they, where Pratchett describes him as a standard model Hubert, which includes being slightly fat and having red hair. And I'm like, look, I get, I get where you're going with this. But again, this book does have some moments, particularly when it comes to one of the antagonist characters, uh, where Pratchett's real blind spot for fat jokes just comes out. And there's just a lot of them. It's not as egregious as some of the other books, but there's some characters in particular who are just consistently made fun of. And you're like, this is unnecessary. Make it about their character territory. It doesn't have to be about their appearance. The gr- the grasping of the lapels of the jacket, though, mm. like that moment oh. when he, you can, it's just, so you good. know, you can see him. You, mm. And everyone knows a Hubert, right? Who is just uh, swelled with the urge to communicate. <laughs> he's definitely wearing a bow tie. If Mr. Bent's not wearing a bow tie, Hubert definitely has one and a lab coat and he's holding the pearls. But it's not symmetrical. And possibly in a film made in the 70s, he would have been played by Benny Hill or Benny Hill alike, I feel. He's got that sort of a look. I'm imagining Benny Hill in as much as there's some very unpleasant aspects to his character in that film, I'm imagining Benny Hill's character from the Italian job where he's like their science guy. Uh, But the Glooper, we should explain in case you're not familiar, is a machine that models the economy of the city of Ankh-Morpork. And he can use it to sort of go, what happens if we halve the cost of labor? It's a model. And I think there's also there's also like a thing in there. It's, it's like somebody in, who's got their model train set in the basement. There's a very much a bit of that vibe mixed in with the mad scientist stuff as well, which I really enjoy. It's interesting that that Hubert is a mad scientist and Hubert is also an economist. Mm. Like it's a, it's a nice little comment on on what economists actually do, which is is kind of mad right and 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 coming up with things that are perhaps a little bit disconnected from reality in some ways i mean obviously we see later this becomes quite literal like the group becomes quite literal but um i thought that was also also a nice little touch there Mm. just so much thought has gone into every detail of like as in all discord books are like that but in this one i felt particularly like nothing in there is just there for the joke there's always a, a layer underneath it that's feeding into the bigger story which i just thought was quite extraordinary Mm. There's a, a line later in the book when Moist is introducing a doorbell to Hubert. He says, Hubert's an economist. That's like an alchemist, but less messy. And and I, I think there is there's de- I think that's very deliberate, you know, like an alchemist trying to turn lead into gold. Economists are trying to turn all kinds of things <laughs> into gold effectively, right? By declaring the exchange and sales and et cetera, et cetera. You can tell I'm not an economist. I'm the wrong Ben McKenzie for that. Uh <laughs> But this kind of concludes Moist's tour of the bank. Although I will also say just before we leave this scene, this is one of two times in the book where there's a direct joke about Moist's name because Moist introduces himself to Hubert. He says, I'm Moist. And Hubert's like, oh, no, I'm sorry. It is so damp in here. We should start giving people umbrellas or something. You know? <laughs> like, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, and there's later on, there's one where he's on the on a roof in the rain and it says Moist was more than Moist. He was like seriously damp or something. I can't remember what the line was, but- yeah, so I mm. and I don't know that we had any jokes like that in Going Postal. They were all just about how unfortunate his name was rather than using it as a literal descriptor of his current situation. Yeah. Hats off to Terry Pratchett for making like one of the most uncomfortable words that, like the name of a character that is like my favorite pretty much. So <laughs> yeah, very good. I mean, speaking of his name, there's also a recurring theme in this book of people getting his surname wrong. Like they call him everything except von Lipwig. Mr. Lipstick. Yeah, there's like lipstick, yeah. lip slick, listwick. Like there's all kinds of yeah weird variations from multiple characters, not just. I think it happened in the previous one, but there was an accent last time. Mm. Right. It was um the golem. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, after this tour, Moist goes home, but he also figures out that Hubert is definitely Topsy's nephew. <laughs> it's like, oh, the family. Mm-hmm. How is he related to her? Which Mr. Ben is like, how did you know that? He's like, ah. Oh. Uh, there's a great interlude before we get to the sort of next part of the plot, which really kicks everything off in the town of Big Cabbage, which is <laughs> what a great section that was. I think every Australian knows a town. <laughs> if you didn't grow up in one, you've been to one on holidays, which is famous for its big thing yep. and the theme that that has. And you go to the gift shop there and there's just all the things. Town I grew up in had a big prawn. It was, <laughs> it was terrible. It was a bad idea. Uh, they've replaced it since with a much better big prawn, but still, and Coffs Harbour's got the big banana. It's, it's such a thing. And I am sure this is where Terry got the idea for Big Cabbage because he spent a lot of time in Australia <laughs> and I think he would have picked up on it. 
It was the big orange, I think, in Berry as well. Um, and if you're driving from Melbourne to Adelaide or back, um, there's the big koala in Dad's which is surprisingly not that big. I was going to talk about the big koala. <laughs> but you can go and have a really nice soup underneath it. They mm. they make their own, or they used to, and there's jams and stuff. There's also um, the big sheep somewhere on, is it a ram? I think it is a ram, actually. I think it's very, very clearly a ram. Away <laughs> <Yes. laughs> from Sydney to Melbourne. Yep. Um, yep. Which I remember, I do remember stopping at when I drove back down. You have to stop at the big thing. It's it's the law, basically. Yeah. But the long list of, like, all of the stuff that's in Big Cabbage was pretty great. People travel miles to see this wonder, the biggest cabbage in the world. They'd go inside its concrete interior. See, this is definitely an Australian big thing, mm-hmm. right? The original big prawn was made of concrete and it was awful mm-hmm. to go in there inside in summer. Uh, but they'd go inside its concrete interior, peer out through the windows, buy cabbage leaf bookmarks, cabbage ink, cabbage shirts, Captain Cabbage dolls, <laughs> musical mm-hmm. boxes carefully crafted from kohlrabi and cauliflower that played the cabbage eaters song, cabbage mm-hmm. jam, kale ale, and green cigars made from a newly developed species of cabbage and rolled on the thighs of local maidens, presumably because they liked it. And then there was the excitement of Brasca World. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, so good. Captures that small town that doesn't have anything else going for it kind of vibe. The small town of, with, with the thing that everybody who lives there is very proud of in a slightly ironic way. Yes, absolutely. Uh, anyway, the reason that we're there is that there's a man there who is dressed as an Omnium priest, and he's kind of described that way, who finds a copy of the Ankmore Pork Times. It was such a tease because it was like, oh, he's found this newspaper and he hasn't, he doesn't look at it in this scene. <laughs> he don't, he, there's no payoff. It's all set up. And I'm like, Terry, you teaser. Um, <laughs> but it comes back later, mm. which is a great aside. But back in Ankmore Pork, this is where the action kicks off because uh, Moist goes back to the post office. He reads up about, about the lavishes. And I do like that, you know, Terry has used the name lavish for this, like, filthy rich banking family. And then he also establishes that that's why the word lavish means that in the disc world. Um, so, maybe that's where Topsy Turvy comes from. I don't know. <laughs> Did she lead an exciting younger life? I don't know. I think she led an exciting life with it. Like, she was, sounds like she was also from a fancy-ish family because she has that whole sort of little tiny rant about how she was once Joshua's mistress. And back then we had standards, but now all it takes is being able to spin upside down on a pole like his latest one. Um, and she's kind of like, mm, I was a better class of mistress, which again shows hierarchies in different places. Yeah. Also worth mentioning in this moment, I think, that we see even between like the really fun sparkling conversation between Topsy and Moist, she's quite anxious that something is going to happen to her. She's got some, like, crossbows at her desk. She's cautious about the food that's brought into her. Like, she is not just having a chill time, except for when she's drinking Mm. her vast quantities of gin. But even then, she's still got her crossbows and her reluctance to leave the room and big caution over who comes in. Mm. And we should say also it is very clearly established that she owns exactly half of the bank, the other half being owned by other members of the lavish family, But Mr. Fusspot owns one share, which means that because he's her dog, she has a controlling share in the bank. And that's going to become very, very important because as Moise is investigating the lavish family, he's noticing, and this also comes up later, he notices how popular $1 and $2 stamps still are because people are using them as a sort of de facto currency because they can stick them in an envelope and mail them to their friends if they need to send some money. Yeah, I love mailing money to my friends. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, no. no, no, I know what you mean. I just. But did you did you never get the like fifty dollar note from your aunt mm. in the card for your birthday? Like she lives in the country and she's sending you money because she wants you to be able to spend it on something nice. Yep. I think that's what's happening yeah. here, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, but also, I mean, like effectively, it was partly used as an exchange, like in fan circles. Like if you were subscribing to a fanzine or if you were ordering a copy of like a back issue of some fan thing, often people would be just like. Send us a thing with the stamp. So you're paying for the postage. And sometimes people say, send an extra stamp because we'll use that for some sending another one out. And that can be payment for the thing that you've sent. So huh. and that's persisted like right through to sort of the 80s and 90s. It's not so common now because sending a money order, which was what a lot of people had access to who didn't have access to checks, was difficult. And checks have sort of really fallen out of favor in Australia as we've sort of shifted so heavily over to electronic banking. The thing that instigates the next part of the plot, though, is, first of all, Moist hears that a doorbell is coming home 
Um, she sends a very brief telegram saying, success, I'm on my way home. I'll explain everything when I get there. Veterinary visits Moist again and says, come on, will you take the job? And Moist says, no. And he says, okay, well, I need you to sign a letter that says you won't take the job because I really want you to, which is a whole thing that doesn't really go anywhere, but it sort of really impresses on Moist how important this is to Veterinary, I think. But also, I think it's Veterinary covering his tracks because he kind of knows what's going to happen next and he doesn't want anyone to think he's engineered it. I, I thought it was actually more him laying the groundwork for him taking the role later because he's like, by denying this is a possibility, he gives the media something to report. And they're like, oh, no, Moist von Lipwig's not going to take this job. Whereas previously, like, were they going to say that he was considering it? It's so sure. by issuing this denial... He's throwing his name in the mix and making the conversation happen in the newspaper. Which feels very, that feels like a very 2024 mainstream media kind of response. Because, you know, one of the criticisms we have of a lot of mainstream media at the moment is that if a politician or someone with any kind of degree of power says something, the way that it's reported in a lot of places is just to repeat what they said with no real commentary or fact checking, particularly in outlets that have a very particular political bent. This was written in 2007, and Terry Pratchett, who worked at newspapers in, like, the 60s and 70s, is already- This is how it works. Like, the ruler of the place says this thing, and it will get reported in the paper. What effect that has, that's kind of up to everyone who reads it, I guess. But, yeah, I thought that was interesting that that still feels like a very current commentary on how that works. I feel like it was definitely- I mean, Veterinary was trying to manipulate the press into getting his particular outcome. Mm. Mm. To the point where they would they would assist him in, in, in his particular outcome, right? His preferred outcome. Yeah. But I thought it was quite a sophisticated approach to that, right? I'm going to outright deny it. I'm going to put it in a position. I cannot possibly be held accountable for the decisions of this man. But okay, if this is what ends up happening, well, let's see. It wasn't my preferred outcome, but actually it is my preferred outcome and I'm going to... Yeah. The government is not meddling. I'm going to be happy that that happened. Not, not meddling in the banks. That's, that's private, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, because there's that bit where he says, there's rumour that I want to nationalise the banks. And Moise says, nationalise? And he says, steal. That's what they think it means. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. What happens, though, that sort of tips, well- Tops. It just sort of pushes Moise into the position whether he wants it or not, is that Topsy Lavish dies. Does she die of old age? Like, there doesn't seem to be anyone killing her. She just dies. And it's not really mentioned how. So, I assume that she's old because there's no mention of poison or assassins or anything- she just dies and death shows up and does a bunch of bank puns, which was a delightful scene, especially when she started suggesting ones he hadn't thought of. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I would have liked a little more justification for why she dies at this, like, very dramatically appropriate moment. But it's fine. There were a couple of jokes about the amount of gin she was drinking. Yeah. Uh. In the scene with Moist, there was a, a line about uh, her pouring herself a just short of lethal, like... Right. Slosh of gin, a glass of gin. So I did wonder if she just like drank herself to death. Like, I mean, obviously he doesn't say, right? But that was sort of where my brain mm-hmm. went, having had that little setup in the previous couple of scenes. I also feel like there's a narrative thing sometimes where someone is willing themselves alive until the thing that they need resolved is resolved. And she's met Moist and she knows what she's going to do. So she's like, it's okay. I can now stop holding on. Like I'm, I doesn't not make a deliberate action to stop it, but you know, where you're like willing yourself to be around to prevent the bad thing from happening. And now things have lined up. It's okay to leave. Yeah. She's letting go. That, that was my read on it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Because what she does is updates her will before she dies. And in the will, she does two things. First of all, she leaves. All of her shares to Mr. Fusspot, who now owns 51% of the bank, (laughs) a controlling share, (laughs) and then places Mr. Fusspot into the care and ownership of one Moist von Lipwig, for which he will be paid $20,000 a year (laughs) and has to act as the de facto chairman of the bank on Mr. Fusspot's behalf, which means he is also the (laughs) head of the Royal Mint. So, he ends up in this position whether he likes it or not. And Moist is very impressed that she uses the carrot and the stick because she's paying him to do this job, but also has put out a contract with the Assassin's Guild that if anything happens to Mr. Fusspot, if he dies of any reason except old age, then- the assassins are coming for him and they send like a courtesy arrow in through his window (laughs) to say, we're watching you, we're on to you. But as Veterinary also points out, she does an extra smart thing there. Um, No one else can take a hit out on Moist because the Assassin's Guild will not take two hits on the same person. Yeah. 
very clever. There's so, again, there's just layers everywhere in this plot. It's really fun how everybody who's like a major player is thinking on several levels at once mm. with, to varying degrees of success. It's great. But now we get to meet the twins. Oh, yes. Because Moist is like, okay, there's assassins. Uh, I've got to get out of here. He takes Mr. Fusspot with him, who's been delivered by Nobby Knobs, which is a nice thing because at this point, everyone knows there's a werewolf in the watch. But everyone assumes it's Nobby Knobs because he doesn't- he's the one who can't prove he's, you know, 100% human without a piece of paper that says so. So, that was kind of nice and it comes back later in the book. But anyway, he escapes out the window. He thinks, oh, there's Lord Veterinary's coach. He's come to talk to me again. Well, I've got some words for him. Uh, And he jumps into the coach, but it is not Lord Veterinary's coach. Although it's meant to look like Lord Veterinary's coach because the man inside is trying to be Lord Veterinary because it is Cosmo Lavish. So sad. Like I, I mean, sad. I hate him, but like it's just he's such a, a sad figure. Like almost like you know the the two sides of a clown. I my big question about Cosmo Lavish. So just uh, to, the basic situation is he's the son of the previous chairman of the bank. He wants to run the bank. He doesn't own the shares. He wants the shares. He has a twin sister. They're both described as being very big people, and there's many jokes about that, particularly for his sister Pucci. But Cosmo Lavish has two sides to him. There's He's obsessed with trying to be Vetinari. There's a whole subplot where he has a, a manservant here for who he's sending off to try and steal Vetinari stuff so he can wear like his clothes and have his artifacts um, and thereby somehow psychically supplant Vetinari, which is clearly not working and not going according to plan. And he's being conned by his servant, as we know, the readers, but he doesn't realize and there's also the whole comical thing where he's trying to perfect the eyebrow raise and he can't do it. So, he can't raise one eyebrow and there's lots of jokes about that as well. My question is, is there too much of that so that he feels like a buffoon and not enough of those little moments? Because there are a few where he actually is thinking very, very craftily because they're kind of, they're, they're hidden a little bit. So, you sort of lend to believe that he's this idiot. And then there's these little moments that are like, but actually he is quite smart and And he is, it's not just that he's got a lot of money and influence. He also is quite clever. Like, for example, in this first scene with Moist, he offers him a bribe. And Moist says he should have offered me more money because he's offered him less money than he's being paid to look after Mr. Fusspot. And then later on, Poochie's like, why didn't you offer him more money? He says, well, I know I offered him not enough. That wasn't the point. The point is, and he, he, he did that on purpose. And you're like, okay, well, he wasn't making a dumb mistake. That was part of his plan. And I just wonder, is that balance right? Did you feel like he was smart enough or too ridiculous? What did you think of him as a villain? I didn't really think of him as having moments of intelligence between his buffoonery. I always felt like he was someone without a personality and who perhaps had just read things like the Discord equivalent of the art of war or this is like, and he's just following a checkbox of the things that he would have thought the veterinary would do none of his tactics to me came across as original thought. So I suspect he would have read, give them a lower amount of money as a bribe here for the tactic that comes later. And that's not something he would have come up with himself. It didn't feel like there was a real Cosmo that was being tamped down. It felt like there was not really a Cosmo and he's trying to make up for that by being the coolest person in the room that he can think of. I never really thought of him as stupid or anything like that. I felt like he was a person whose obsession with veterinary overrode everything else. Mm. So it sort of like warped all of his like critical thinking skills, his strategy, all of that stuff, all the things he wanted. Everything was kind of colored by this obsession with veterinary. So it sort of almost didn't matter whether he was like the, the capacity of his intelligence because it was all kind of through this lens. It was going to go in a particular direction and it was all going to be a bit bonkers he's trying to be the devious kind of conniver partly because he wants to be veterinary and that's what veterinary is also partly because he's just selfish right like his whole family is sort of overridden with selfishness but in him it's kind of got this like the extra dimension of of veterinary all the time so i kind of never i never really thought about him in terms of his like his intellectual capacity only his obsession and how that was like changing what he was doing or altering the course of what he was doing. He wants the bank and he wants control of it, but the veterinary thing kind of overrides all of that in the end. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I think, I think I, I mean, look, I, I certainly liked him as a character and I enjoyed that he had those two things. Like he had a lot of things going on, you know, he wasn't sort of a, a one dimensional villain. I mean, not that Richard Gilt in going postal is necessarily a one dimensional villain, but he's very much just like, 
a conniving con man who's also a high flying businessman, right? Like he's he's kind of those two things together. And those two things were not at odds Whereas with each other. Here, you know, in Cosmo Lavish, you've got this, yeah, this obsession with Vetinari and trying to get the job done. And they do come into conflict because he's making a lot of stupid decisions or at least being very credulous about the things that he's getting one of his servants to do. I think he's being blinded by his obsession. Mm, yeah. I, I think that's where he's making mistakes and, and kind of falling into holes is the obsession blinds him to what's actually going on. I know it's like, it's such a simple thing, but I do love every time he, he referred to hit for a yeah. drop knot. Like it was just beautiful. And the, like the fact that you had in, in, in the assistant that this sort of like increasing, like what the hell, <laughs> like I need to get out of here. <laughs> this guy is yeah. mad. Just kind of added to the coloring of, of Cosmo, I thought, you know, and a really, I gave the reader a little bit of a sort of indulgent outlet, I think, for this for this character you could feel was increasingly becoming mad. Mm. Mm. And I do like that he's kind of the only character who clearly sees that's what's happening, whereas everyone else is yeah. kind of doesn't even notice that he's trying to be like Vetinari because he's not that good at it. <laughs> or does in the case of like Pucci and is like, what are you doing? Yeah, that's Like, true. you're an idiot. <laughs> rather than rather than actually being afraid of him, which I think is the difference with Heatherfall, right? Pucci's just like, you're my stupid brother. Mm. But- um, and, and just obsession is dumb, but like heretofore is like, this guy's dangerous and this obsession is dangerous and I need to get out of here, even though he never quite does. I think he becomes dangerous as like the septicemia or, or what, or the infection from the too tight ring is getting to him. So like it's the, his line between reality and his obsession becomes completely blurred. And Terry did a really nice job throughout the story of showing that and amping up how I think off kilter he was getting. So. Yeah. And yeah, there is that sort of poisoned element as well, because he, in this scene or in this chapter, he, he does, yeah, he gets the ring, like you were saying, which is a, a stygium ring. It's this weird uh, magical metal that when it's in sunlight, it heats up incredibly hot um, and can even explode. And Vetinari does have one. It's his signet ring. And Hidafor has gotten a copy of it, which he claims he has then snuck into the palace and swapped for the real one. But he hasn't, of course, he's just brought the copy home. And so he wears it and he won't get it resized. He wears the veterinary sized one on his much bigger finger. And then as somebody put it, there's all this arm and finger based body horror. <laughs> so he's like wears it under a glove and he starts to go gangrenous. And there's all these sort of veins of poison going up his bloodstream in, in his arm. It's, it's, oh, it's gross, uh, but great. What a powerful ring. There's a neat doubling there, though. Like, is the ring increasing his madness or is what's happening to his hand and the sort of poison in him a metaphor as well, right, of, of what's going on? What is, is it literal or is it metaphorical or is it both at the same time? I think it's a bit of both. really neat way that Pratchett works with his yeah images and characters, I think, in that way. Yeah, and it just occurs to me, too, that this sort of corruption because of a ring is, uh, is yeah. maybe a reference to something that Pratchett is clearly aware of but doesn't reference very often. And he's very careful in how many times he makes Lord of the Rings jokes. He's like, maybe just one every five books. Like, that's enough. And I think this is very subtle. Bury it, bury it a little, right? Don't make it really obvious. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. You know, while that, all that's going on, including a meeting of the whole lavish clan where Cosmo's like, shut up, I've got this in hand, off you go, I've, I'm going to sort it out. And then has a private conversation with Pucci, who, who notices he's starting to go off the deep end on this whole veterinary stuff. But he also says, no, I've got this. I'm, I'm going to sort this out. Moist goes to the bank and starts taking on the job of chairman. Uh, importantly, he signs all of the documents on Fusspot's behalf, doing little paw prints, but also co-signing mm-hmm. to say, yeah, I'm taking uh, ownership of the bank and you're signing all of the stuff over. And there's lots of forms, which he doesn't read because there's like hundreds and hundreds of pages of them. And he meets some of the other staff who are there, um, including the cook, Amesbury, who we discover is allergic to the word garlic, not the thing, uh, and his daughter, Peggy. And he has an interview. But just very quickly, it's when he signed the stuff without reading it, it seemed very out of character to me. Like, because he's a con man, he's used to people trying to pull the wool over his eyes. It just seemed, when he was signing that thing, I was just like, okay, so he's like doing something about it. But really he was just ignorantly signing a thing that he should have read. And that didn't track with me for his character. Do you think it was because of Mr. Bent? I don't know. Like, because he doesn't trust Mr. Bent either. So I don't feel like that would be, but I mean, it could have been he signed it and they slipped it in later. I'm not sure, but he didn't read it at all. So there isn't like, that's really by the by, and I just thought that was surprising considering how suspicious-minded he should be of other people trying to con him. Hmm. It did very much feel like um, like Chekhov's gun, that scene, right? 
you're like, okay, when's this going to come back? Yeah. And I wonder, actually, thinking about it in hindsight, a bit like the death of Topsy, um, I feel like I feel like there's a, there's a couple of points in this book where you can see that Pratchett is like, I need to get the character from here to here. Something needs to happen here. Okay, fine. I'm just going to put the block into the hole. Mm. And it's maybe not as sharp as it might have been in a different, like maybe in an earlier book. But sometimes you just need to like fill a plot hole mm. with a little connecting plot point. And it feels like maybe this is one of them, right? Like, mm-hmm. I need this thing. And it's slightly out of character. It doesn't really work. It does. It did twang with me as well. Um, I couldn't really tell what. I think partly because it just seems so obvious. Like, he, we're hanging the gun on the wall, right? This is going to come back <laughs> later. Mm. But. Yeah, I think there's a couple of points where you can see its structure in a way that is a little bit more obvious than Pratchett is capable of doing, I think. Do you think that might be an artifact of that he's writing about banking and finance without really writing about banking and finance? Like, it's not really about that. But he also, because that's still the nominal theme of the book, he's not introducing a whole bunch of other stuff in. Like, there's stuff with the golems and things, but yeah. I actually think this is a book about bureaucracy mm. rather than about banking so much. I think it's at least at least on 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 one level a book about the sort of absolute awfulness of of bureaucratic life and office life. Mm. And um, I just feel like there's there seems to be actually a lot less action in this book than in some of his others, right? You think about the other Ankh Morpork books, maybe even like the watch the watch books, right? There's a lot more danger. There's a lot more kind of drama. Um, I mean, it gets pretty dramatic near the end, but I feel like it takes, it takes quite a long time to get to that. And a lot of it is just sort of like politics yeah. and, mm. and manipulating people. And, and that it's, it's incredibly readable and really fun, right? But it's still, it's still also about these two very bureaucratic institutions or they want very bureaucratic institution of a bank. There's another, there's another joke that comes later in the book, which I talk about when we get to it, that made me really think about this. This is actually a book about bureaucracy, management, offices. Oh, yeah. Um, in more than it is a book about money per se. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. I think you're right. And, and, mm. uh, yeah, I thought that too, like reading it, I, got, I, I had a good time reading it. I really enjoyed it. I think it's very clever. It's very funny. But I also kind of got to the end and go, not a huge amount happened, you know, in the large scheme of things. Like in going postal, there's assassinations, there's like a fire, there's, uh, like a character explodes. At one point, there's like hacking going on and there's this mysterious messages. There's like mail that's awakened and becoming psychically aware and wants to be delivered. Like there's a whole bunch of bigger stuff happening. Whereas here, while there are, there's things that happen, but a lot of it is relatively mundane things. Like you're being offered a bribe. Someone tries to get a compromising photograph of you. Like it's stuff that's not- Relatively, just relatively mundane things. Relatively about, like- mundane things for a <laughs> yeah. Discord book, you know, like- For um, a Discord book. The, like pithy chats and sort of like, yeah, politicking and going from the bank to the post office to veterinaries to- the bank to the post office to veterinary. It was like a, a, a lot of that, mm. which again, I enjoyed every minute, but like, I mean, like one of the most exciting things being like, Oh, he's drawing some money. This is happening. And now he's going to go and like get some people to try out this paper money. I was like, that's like the big action scene of the middle, which yeah. is, um, again, <laughs> loved it. But like, I was <laughs> like, that was the most, like, cause I guess also cause they're in a different setting. Like you're not in one of these three places, which is taking out the bulk of the novel. Mm. Can't emphasize again how much I loved it, but yeah. Yeah, and I, I think the ending too is a bit more Deus Ex Machina in this book. Like the thing that resolves the plot is is not the action of the main characters in any real way. Like it's very coincidental. Whereas in Going Postal, Moist makes a very crucial decision at the end of the book using the resources that he's amassed during the book that turns the tide and, and wins the day eventually, which is his decision to not just crash the Clax network, but to intercept and send a fake message that exposes Reacher Guilt's crimes. And even though there's no evidence, it doesn't matter. It's made public, so they have to investigate it, which means they'll uncover the evidence. And that's a really clever way to resolve that plot. Whereas here, it's the arrival of these ancient golems that kind of resolves the situation. And while that is set in motion by one of the main characters, it's not really related to the rest of the plot, except coincidentally. So I think, yeah, it's not as neat as some of the other books, I think. But it's still a good time. I don't think it was written this way on purpose, but it is interesting that in the first Moist von Ludwig book where he is a con man, basically alone, he's building connections. He solves everything on his own. But now he is like a member of the community. He has a partner. He has allies. The thing that solves it is his girlfriend's side project. So... (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, it's he's now not working on his own. He's got people supporting him. So. Yeah, I, that's very funny. Although I do feel like calling the Golem Trust her side project is maybe a bit <laughs> no, no, dismissive. No, no, not the Golem, as in like her side project within the Golem Trust. Like she's like, I'm going to go dig, but you know what I mean. Like, I, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I'm yeah. just diminishing the worth of women. I don't think that her job is real. <laughs> that's, Women's labor so you, as well. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, her little well, life hobby, going there. you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, her very important work at the Golem Trust is the thing that fixes the situation. Yeah, that's true. But speaking of Women's Labour, to bring it back to the bit of the plot we were up to, we also get his first interview in this book with Sakharissa Cripslock from mm. the Yankmore Pork Times. And I think one of the great things about this, and every time that he speaks to the press, particularly in this book, but also in Going Postal, is that this is where he's like, well, I've got to say something on the record. Let's just talk and see what happens. And here he's very <laughs> he's very conscious of that process. He's like, once I'm talking, the con man brain has kicked in. And while I'm not swindling anyone, I am still just saying stuff and figuring out how that's going to work. And I'm just letting my brain do its own thing and I'll catch up and understand what I mean later. So, when he's in this interview, he says that he doesn't think gold is that important, which for someone who's just taken over the Royal Bank and the Mint is maybe quite a controversial thing to say when the bank is still on a gold standard. Oh, she can feel the front cover coming her way, like as like as this interview is coming. Yeah. Good. But then also he says he's literally going to give away money in order to revitalize the bank. One of the things we haven't touched on really is the reason. So in going postal, there's a very clear reason he needed to take over the post office, which is that it was completely defunct. Like they hadn't delivered any mail for a long time. It had been completely outclassed by the CLAC system, but the CLAC system had fallen into the hands of these, you know, gross capitalists and had been monopolized and was also being driven into the ground. So it's like, well, we need the post office back because the CLAC system is not sustainable the way that it's being run. And so that was kind of the impetus. Here, the impetus for Vetinari wanting the bank to be reformed is that he needs money because he's got this whole plan. He wants to do the undertaking, which is a great pun. He's got this great plan to make this underground train network using the dwarf devices that they find in uh, Thud and, you know, dig out, dig out, basically make an underground train system and hook it up to the docks. It's going to be really expensive and he needs finance for the city to do that. And he's like, but I'm not going to get it from the current banks who don't have that kind of money and wouldn't lend it to me anyway, even if they do. I need a bank that will. I need a bank that can stimulate the economy in some way. And I don't think it's necessarily deeply explained what the problem is or how it's going to work, but it is clearly stated that this is the reason behind it all. And so when Moist is talking to Sakharissa, he's sort of going, what am I going to do to change the bank and make it work? And how am I going to turn this around and make it good? And he starts at the bottom. And I think this is where, you know, this is also part of when looking at what Moist does and what he thinks It doesn't quite fit in with him being on that other side of the class divide because when he starts changing the bank, he's thinking about regular people using it. He doesn't get, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about the upper class people. They already have all the banking services they need, but he comes into the bank and he's like, let's make it clean. Let's make it a nice place for people to come into. Let's change the queuing system so that people can get served quickly because they've got to go back to work. Right. And also we'll have people can have an account if they've got 10 bucks, like they don't have to come in here with $5,000. And that's like a real interesting change. And I I guess a historical change that banks would have been through as well. Money out of mattress. It's kind of a democratization of banking. Mm. I mean, I hesitate to use that word, but that's sort of where it's, that's sort of kind of the gist of it in this case, I think. It's not just for the rich, but we are going to still keep a certain amount of power in the bank, I think. Also in the bank, this is where Moist comes up with, as we've alluded to, the idea of paper money, of banknotes. And he's inspired by quite a few things. So he's inspired by the idea of the stamps. He's inspired by the personal promissory note that Cosmo gives him as a bribe, which he signs across a stamp, which is a real thing that people used to do. And he goes, it needs to have these things on it. And it should have the chairman's signature, which is this cute moment where he puts like Mr. Fussbot's paw print on the prototype banknote. Mm. And he makes a few of them. And then he just goes out to test it out and see if it'll work. And he goes down to 10th Egg Street. He goes to Boffo's Joke Shop, which is uh, very important in the Tiffany Aching books. Mm-hmm. Um, and he buys uh, some gold glitter because he's been given the bank chairman's hat, which is a top hat. And he's like, it does not go with my gold suit. <laughs> so, he buys some gold mm-hmm. glitter to, you know, glam it up. But he tests out the banknote and people are a bit skeptical, but 
they accept it and they talk about it and they're like, okay, this is great. One of them says to him at some point, is this like a stamp? And he's like, yeah, sure. Several times during this book, he's able to bribe people by giving them rare stamps because everybody knows that some of them are worth a lot of money, uh, which is pretty great. The next day, his interview comes out in the paper. People turn up to the bank. Partly, it's Pucci and some of the wealthy customers who are like, this bank's nonsense now. I'm taking my money out. But then hundreds of people also turn up to put their money into the bank because Moist has become this sort of very popular sort of folk hero, more or less, from saving the post office. He's, you know, he's famous for praying to the gods and being given $150,000 and making all these grand schemes and foiling the, the bigwigs at their own game, you know, when he beat the grand trunk in his great race. And so, you know, he's this figure that's loved by the people. And they're like, you're running the bank? Yeah, I'll come put my money in the bank. Sure, why not? And uh, so, lots of people do. Mm. And importantly, one of the people who does that is Harry King. Love that guy. <laughs> so, both, both Dibbler, Dibbler, of course, shows up asking for a small loan. And there's that great bit where Moist is like, oh, so you've got to expand into like a franchise. And he's like, no, I just want a better card. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then also Harry King turns up, who's played a major part in a couple of the previous books, including The Truth, where he's like, I, I want to expand my operations. You know, things are changing. The If the undertaking is going to go ahead, there's going to be- a lot of dirt and crap that needs to be gotten rid of. That's my business, but I'm going to have to expand. And he's also, I mean, he's also monopolizing. He's like, I'm going to buy out all the competition. But, you know, we like Harry King, so we're not so worried about that, I guess. Mm. He's not a disruptor. But uh, he's like, I'm going to need some more money. So, I'm going to put a bunch of money in the bank. There's questions around how he's going to secure it. He's like, I'm Harry King. You know I'm good for it. <laughs> you know, it's a really, that's a nice scene. No, I I like that he does it as a, like, he does a whole bunch of power moves in there and he sort of puts Bent in his place who he keeps calling your monkey and he brings in his person to talk to him. And after he basically makes them give them the money, like the, the assurance um for all of this, after that he's like, also his deeds to a bunch of stuff, which would have saved a lot of conversation, but he's just showing how powerful he is. Yeah, that was great. And the bit where Moist spits on his hand to do the handshake. And Harry King's like, I didn't think bankers did that. He goes, well, I'm not a regular banker. <laughs> and this also means, though, that this is a great success. There's a lot more people coming into the bank. Uh, Moist is, uh, auctions off, like, the first prototype banknotes uh, to raise money for kids and then tells Mr. Bent to donate it anonymously to, like, an actual charity. And Mr. Bent is surprised. It's like, you don't want your name all over it. I, I kind of pegged you as, like, a grandiose person who wants all the credit. He's like, no, no, no. Give the money quietly. It's fine. Because he knows people will find out anyway. Yeah. yeah. So there is a cyn- there's a cynical side to it, but there's also some real altruism involved. So I think I think and that's um, which I think kind of sums up Moist a lot. <laughs> you know that there's he's very cynical, but his heart is ultimately in the right place. But yeah, he realizes he's got to get his paper money into production real quick because he's going to need a lot of cash to give to people who are asking for loans, and there's not enough coins, and he can't make the coins quickly enough. Uh, so he goes to his regular paper supplier for the stamps. He says, yeah, we can do it. But, you know, people are going to make copies of this unless you use a really good engraver who can make a really detailed picture. Mm. Like this stamp. He's like, oh, yeah, wow. You can see all the detail. He says, well, actually, you can't unless you use a microscope. (laughs) Get in there and have a look. (laughs) He says, yeah, this is amazing. I need that guy. And he's like, well, unfortunately, that guy's going to get hanged. Remember that guy that you gave evidence against for forging stamps? That's the guy. (laughs) He's going to be hanged tomorrow. This is bad news. And Moist is like, I need that guy. And so, he breaks him out of prison. Teeny tiny heist. It's great. And he does it it the very officious way. Like, he disguises himself as a guard and comes in with, like, forged papers. And it all goes well. And then once this guy, Alswick Jenkins, what a great name. Once he comes out of the the prison, he's like- Bye. (laughs) Kicks Moist in the (laughs) fork and runs for it. You know? (laughs) That was such a good moment. (laughs) I don't think, like, it's rare that someone is this good at, like, slapstick and physical Mm. comedy in prose, but Pratchett, he nails it when he does it. And this was such a great moment. It was so good. And unexpected. I didn't remember that that happens, but it was so great. And it was a good sort of time back to, like, as you said, the seeds were sown at the very beginning. We mentioned Owlswick at the very beginning of the book as something that Mm. Moist regrets because he had to testify and all that. And he's like, all he was doing was forging stamps and it was not really even to make money. It seemed like it was for the art of it. So they've, like, seeded that for this now and it's just paying off beautifully. Yeah. There's also that nice, like, mirror of the the man on death row kind of um, Moist having been there himself and... Um, but it's, it's interesting. I did think it was interesting that he didn't at that moment think that veterinary might 
have mm. plans for Auswick. Yeah, I I kind of I got the impression that he because he because he kind of does it himself, right? Because he figures out that Auswick's just gone home because he wants to keep mm. doing his engraving and painting. He goes there and finds him, and he's clearly a little bit also a bit unstable like he says some really weird stuff that's like okay this guy's got some problems but he's a genius i need his genius um i i kind of and i don't think it's in the text really but i got the impression that he was like well veterinary might do it but i don't have time to wait around and find out if that's true and also i don't want to be in his pocket anymore you know i don't want to be in his debt any more than i already am <laughs> so i kind of and i think i've conjured that i don't think that's quite in the text but yeah. It does, but it's, there's a few points throughout this book where you get the sense that Moist is trying to pull himself away from veterinary, right? He doesn't want to be like, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be sort of the puppet um, for veterinary's games. Um, and maybe there's a certain amount where he kind of almost ruse the fact that his guardian angel is this kind of person, you know? It doesn't seem out yeah. of character that he's kind of gone off ahead, but it did seem odd that he didn't think about it. Obviously, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I feel like there's a point later where he didn't realize that the veterinary would have plans and he sort of clicks on them and he's like, oh, crap, I've like messed up this whole thing and I should have realized that. But I also think that at first I was like, it's out of character that he wouldn't have considered that veterinary would have plans. But I also think Moist, by necessity of his character, has severe protagonist syndrome. So he wouldn't necessarily think this is a regular thing that veterinary does. They would be like, it's just me. I'm special. Only me had this happen. Whereas it's probably been done tons of time. Like... Who knows how many people at the top echelon of like keeping Angamore Fork running have had this happen to them. So I think perhaps there's a little bit of I'm special. Oh wait, maybe I'm not that special. Does that Neri have Leonard de Quirm in in the palace somewhere at this point? Mm-hmm. Um because that that was the one that came to mind. I was wondering actually at this point if that if he was gonna come out at some point. But yeah, he's an interesting, because I thought of him too, and I, he's sort of a special case because he's more there just so he doesn't accidentally invent something that someone else can use to, you know, destroy the entire city. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, but, and it's not clear, I don't think he's faked his death. I think he's just sort of keeping him safely mm. contained. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a very similar situation. And we know at the end of Going Postal, he offers Richard Gilt the same kind of deal in order to take over the bank. And Richard Gilt says no and walks through the door that, leads to his death presumably mm. uh but it's great that moist uses that same language like he asks alswick if he believes in angels which is exactly what Vetinari said to him in going postal and tries to do it himself then he brings him back to the basement and it's great that he immediately sort of gets igor on side and he does later on say you know i'm an uber wild boy i i know all about this stuff um, when they drink the splot, um, which is a weird sort of slightly sideways thing that comes out of nowhere, but love it though. Yeah, it's it's nice that he just sort of falls in with Igor. He's like, Igor, I need to bring someone into the bank without anyone knowing. And Igor's like, Yes, Martha, of course. You know, he's like, No problem, no questions asked. Like, this is the job, right? And then also, he's like, I need you to make him forget the name Alswick Jenkins. He's like, Yes, I'm on it. <laughs> and then he like transfers bits of his brain into a turnip. You know, like it's just there's a lot of great hijinks that go on there. But he does get Alswick back. He changes his name and he, he designs the front side of the banknote. And it's beautiful. It's perfect. It's amazing. And then after he's had his mind changed by Igor, he just sort of doodles on the back of it. And it's it's rubbish. So, Moise is like, you've got to put, him, put his brain back. He's taken out all his artistic talent, which was a funny joke. But it's also that trope of associating. It feeds into the tortured artist trope. That was slightly disappointing. But there were still some funny gags that came out of it. Hmm. Who would have thought that turnips were the most, like, mentally together of the vegetables? <laughs> I mean, they're very dependable, aren't they? I did kind of interpret that a little bit, like, I mean, I, I definitely think that was the trope of the mad artist there, obviously, and he, he does bring that out a bit in other books too, I think. But I did get a sense that Pratchett maybe was thinking people who are very creative in this way are often very complex and understand see complexity mm-hmm. in the world and thinking about the world through the eyes of like a turnip, which is a very simple, very like bland vegetable. It doesn't create much greatness. Mm. Um, but it's like, I think there's a way to interpret it. It's a, perhaps a little more generous than the, than the, the, the title trope of mad artist that is more about like, if you see complexity, it's going to, it's not all going to be good. Um, and that can be very hard, but again, it, it, yeah. maybe that is a little bit generous for this particular no. characterization. I think the other thing that makes me maybe less forgiving of the in this book is that 
it's a problem, but then it gets reversed so quickly that it's not really clear what its plot point is. I guess it maybe delays the banknotes being ready a little bit, but not heaps. Like, it was fun, but I was also like, okay, so you introduced a problem and then you fixed it pretty much straight away. Why Why did we do this bit? Uh, it, it, do we just want to put someone's brain in a jar? <laughs> like, I mean, that's cool. I'm, I'm all here for it. I love the Igor stuff. I think if they hadn't done that, though, Owlswick would not have been in it for enough time to make it worth establishing him as a character. So, like, I think the delay was part of it. And also, we need a bit more time in the basement near the glooper because that comes into play later as well. Otherwise, things might seem a bit abrupt further along. I think this is another example, though, of his, like, occasionally having to put a plot point in um, in order to have the plot point there and it's not as smooth. as Like, when you're reading it, you're like, okay, yeah, cool. But then thinking back on it later, you're like, that's a bit clunky, right? Like, Mm. the plotting is not as sophisticated in this book, I don't think, as it is in other books that he's written. And there's a few times now that we've kind of hit on those. It's like, that doesn't quite work. Or it's not really clear why it's there. Hmm. I think this is another case of that. He had to he had to have something there. The banknotes needed some kind of friction around them, but it's not really kind of integrated into the story in a really seamless way. Mm. Yeah. And I think, I mean, and this is the point of the plot where he's throwing all the ingredients in and he's stirring it up, you know, like it's it's simmering because we have that happening with the banknotes. We have the man we now know is named Cribbins, the guy who found the newspaper in Big Cabbage. He has sent a letter to Moist, which Moist has read that says, I know who you are watch out, you're going to be in trouble. And Moise is like, surely it's a scam. It's just a scam. But it's sort of in the back of his head. And then this, that guy turns up at the bank. Moist recognizes him as Cribbins, like a guy he ran with when he used to pull cons back in the day, who knows that he's Albert Spangler. And he's like, well, this is bad news, but I can't deal with it right now because there's a bunch of other stuff going on. I've got to negotiate with the men of the sheds and get them to be security for the banknotes because we're going to have to get the printing press here into the mint and make them on the premises. You know, Adora Bell comes back and explains what she's been doing, which is that this spot was where they'd heard this message from the golems that had communicated with the other golems, and they were really, really old, and that probably means they're from the very first city of Um, which is a great great pun on the city of Ur, um, or the idea of Ur being like, you know, the first civilization. But anyway, these Umnian golems might be made of gold, but she's not really sure because they got a message from them, but it's in the language of the ancient golems, which the modern golems kind of understand, but not the nuance of it. So she needs to go to the university and talk to someone who speaks that language, which means the necromancy department, or as they prefer to be known, the uh, Department of Postmortem Communications. <laughs> and there's such a, oh, there's so much fun stuff there with Professor Fleet and, and Professor Hicks and the Cabinet of Curiosity, which has like the example of an ancient golem with the writing on it so they can check that it's the right language. There's a whole bunch of fun stuff that happens at university, but it's really kind of a, an aside to the plot. It's not really part of the main plot. It kind of does. There is a there is an extra layer to the joke of the name Chimeria, though, as well, because mm-hmm. Sumeria is the place in the Middle East where the first tablets with writing on them were found, right? It's ancient writing is in the is in Samaria. When you're looking at these, like, you know, these clay, these clay things with all of this ancient writing on it, and you have to go and find to the, the professor. I just thought that was, it, it sort of comes out, it, I, I realized it later in the book that this was mm. a, this was a play on this, like, ancient part of, of our um, history. So, yeah. just layers. It's just done very well. Yeah, there's a lot, all of that stuff is great, and there's a lot of great puns and that stuff going on. The other thing that happens at this point in the book is Cosmo has been to see Mr. Bent. He's like, well, it's time to lean on Mr. Bent because we know something about your past, Mr. Bent, which you probably don't want anyone else to know. So maybe if you could find anything that might help us get rid of this Moist guy, that'd be great. And Mr. Bent is there when Moist meets Cribbins and recognizes him and accidentally calls him by name, confirming that he knows who he is, even Mm -hmm. though he claims not to. And Mr. Bent does tell Cosmo that and then is kind of racked with guilt about it. And as a result of that and all the other things that are going on that are putting pressure on this life that he's built for himself, um, he makes a mistake with a capital M, which he never does. And I love how they kind of build up that the guy who- Because his mistake, by the way, is not just him making a mistake. It's him identifying that another clerk has made a mistake and sending his work back to him. He checks his work and he's like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> then he talks to some other people and they all gather around and they're like, uh, uh, and then they take it up to him and say, sir, I, I don't think there is a mistake here. <laughs> and he basically loses it completely once he realizes he's made a mistake. 
in the accounting. That whole sequence was so well done because they amped up the tension of it and I could actually very clearly see the room that they have, like him in his like at his desk that he can use treadles to move around so he can see anyone any given time. So there's like a tension in the room all the time. And he's got a big stack of papers that he makes his way through very quickly. And when he finds a mistake, everyone just sort of shrivels and hopes it's not them. And then when he finds the guy and they, there's that line, I can't remember exactly, but it's like, who's about to make banking history or become banking legend. Cause it's a very young clerk who probably like doesn't quite know the full like horrors of Bent's like finding mistake. Yeah. He goes through it and he's like, mm, I think actually this is not really a problem. And mm. Mr. Apes is trying to sort it out. And there's the horror slowly dawns over everyone. And it's like creeping towards Mr. Bent. And then he just sort of like loses it and goes like just real classic, like office breakdown situation. And it's just so vividly rendered and beautiful. And yeah, I don't know. Pratchett makes quite a bit of use in this book of, I mean, he always writes in that sort of past tense where, you know, the the way the story is written, it's so you're hearing about it later, but it's still kind of immediate. But there are quite a few times in this book where he has little asides, like that one that you just mentioned where this clerk didn't know it, but he was about to go on down in banking history. There's also a bit where Moist says a couple of things and there's like an aside that says he would later come to regret having said that. And stuff like that, which is not something that Pratchett uses a lot in a lot of the books. But I noticed in this one, he did use it quite a bit. And I thought that was interesting that he thought this book needed it or that this book would have a theme of that, which I thought was kind of cool. I wonder if it's a way of like building tension in a, in a scene where there's, I mean, something happens in this scene, but it's it's not like full of action in the way that some of the others are, right? And I wonder if that's part of it, right? It's trying to build the tension here to kind of show you that this is a significant thing that's about to occur later. It will be looked back on as a significant thing. Mm. So he sort of shifts his language a little in a way that he does. He doesn't Because like you say, he doesn't use that device very often. But mm. when he does, it's almost always a tension-building moment. Yeah. Yeah, because it's hard to build tension with, like, someone's made a mistake in some numbers. I mean, for a lot of books, it would be. For this one, he's already very much built it up that Mr. Bent never makes a mistake with numbers and always knows what time it is. Um, so that's happening. Uh, and Mr. Bent disappears. Nobody knows where he's gone, but he leaves. And a whole bunch of the other clerks leave the bank, which becomes a scandal later on, which is a problem. One of the other things that happens is that Hubert finishes the glooper. And Igor informs him that not only is it a perfect model of what the economics in the city do, but it's actually, it's like an as above, so below, or in this case, as the chapter heading says, <laughs> as below, so above kind of situation where it exactly mirrors what's actually happening in the economics of the city. And if they change conditions in the glooper, it will make changes in the economic conditions of the city. And that is scary, but more so because Hubert realizes that the vial that shows how much gold is in the bank says there's no gold in the bank, which is a bit of a worry. Mm. Cosmo gets wind of all of this nonsense happening at the bank. Oh, this looks like a good opportunity to get rid of Moist. But also he's getting here to for to get the last bit of the puzzle he needs to become Vetinari, which is his sword cane. And there's this great bit where the myth about Lord Vetinari's sword cane is that it's made of the iron from the blood of 1,000 men, which seems like a very much a, a callback to the book Wintersmith, where there's a recurring children's rhyme about what makes a man, and it's enough iron to make a nail. Uh, which is the idea that there's, that there's enough iron in the blood of one person mm. to make a nail. It's probably more or less than that. But, you know, you get the idea. So I thought that was a nice callback. Well, we learned that from X-Men. It's okay. Yeah. What's what's a nail or two between friends? For me, this was where, and this is maybe where my earlier idea that Cosmo is a bit of a buffoon about this. We can be generous and say that he's blinded by his obsession. But surely anyone who knows anything about Vetinari would know that he wouldn't really have a sword made from the iron from the blood of a thousand men. Like, that is clearly a myth that Vetinari would create to frighten certain kinds of people. But, I mean, I feel like as readers, we know Vetinari better than the general public would. So I, I, I would believe that there are a vast majority of people out in Ankh Pork who do believe in the sword and that Cosmo would oh, yeah. as well because he has not been granted the same kind of audiences that, say, Sam Vimes has or that Moist has. So I think absolutely he puts that out in the world, but he doesn't know veterinary well enough to know that he's generating the legend and he's trying to be the legend. So I, I do think that is reasonable that he would be on board with that being truth, even though it's very silly. There's also the discussion in the book somewhere about the different people who go to the Assassin's Guild right? There's mm. the people who are going to be assassins and then there's the rich boys 
from rich families who are actually just kind of like shamming it, mm. like they're doing it for the prestige rather than for the, for the actual skills. And I think this is a clear example of Cosmo as one of that cohort, right? Like he's all about the illusion of the thing and he think the wielding of add-ons of power, right? Like the images of power rather than the actual manifestation of it. And so I can absolutely see him as this sort of cosseted rich boy kind of going, yeah, 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 the patri- the patrician, he absolutely has like a giant sword that's made out of a whole lot of blood of people, right? Like <laughs> I-, I could see him falling for that kind of allure rather than sort of thinking about the actual manifestation of power and how veterinary wields it. And mm-hmm. like coming off that, it was cool. I've forgotten the name, which is terrible, of the actual assassin that we have here who- Oh, Professor Crabble? Cranberry. Yeah. Cranberry, cranberry, that's right. Cranberry. Some sort of delicious food that can be a sauce. Anyway, <laughs> um, he keeps being sent by Cosmo to bump off anyone who is privy to what he's doing to gather all of veterinarians' things. And they have that scene where he's like, I didn't bully you at the Assassin's Guild. We were there at the same time, right? Like, I didn't bully you. And he's sort of going, no, I rem-. like, there's strongly implied that if he did, you, he would be dead. But it shows that they went to the same school. They had an entirely different experience because they have that line about the fancy boys not doing the real classes, like they're not doing the... The black syllabus. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to figure out if we have any real clues as to how old Cosmo is, because I was like, was he there at the same time as Tepic from Pyramids? And I think the answer is probably no. But there's, yeah, the, it's always been the case that the Assassin's Guild has been presented as it's also the best school. But it used to be that if you went there, you also learned to be an assassin. Like, that wasn't optional, but now... So I guess it would be after Tepic's time. Now it is optional. Like you can send your kids to get the education, but not learn to kill people. Isn't it like how King Charles went to Timbertop, but didn't do any of like the marathons or whatnot? (laughs) I I guess, I guess it is like that. (laughs) He's not the same age as veterinary because veterinary was like, wasn't there at the same time. No, he was there like 30 years ago. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I got the sense that like he's middle-aged, maybe like early middle-aged um, veterinaries are like a generation ahead. Yeah, he's in like his 50s. Yeah, he's not as old as Topsy. Mm. Mm. I agree with you that there is this great thing about the different experiences of the same school, and which is very much common on class there. But it's now that he's like, once I get this sword, you know, my arm will be complete. I'm, I'm, I don't know why this phrase is coming to me from, <laughs> from uh, <laughs> uh, Sweeney Todd, but it seems appropriate. Why don't we follow through like Bent's plot? Next- you know, Moist is, is like presented with all these clerks who are like, Mr. Bent's made a mistake and he's gone. And they're all worried. And he's there's that moment where he's like, well, of course, there's the only one thing I can do. I have to go and look for him. So he goes with Miss Drapes to Mrs. Cake's place, which is another clue that he's maybe differently normal, I think is a phrase. And then Ludmilla Cake says, who is to say what normal is anyway? Which I thought was like, mm. great. That's the, that's the attitude we want. Um mm. But anyway, they, they go to his apartment. He's not there in his room. The only thing that's in his room is this wardrobe with a magical lock on it. And then they go back to the bank and they kind of like, we don't know where he is. And they, they, they need some extra keys. They search for some keys, which is where they uncover the secret <laughs> fetish wardrobe of uh, the previous chairman. And this book, I checked, this book was written four years before Fifty Shades of Grey. So I wonder <laughs> if I there's that some influence that up. there in the other direction. Um Anyway, and that um, which is where um, Mr. Fusspot gets his new favourite toy, which is definitely not an old rubber bone. Um, or is it sort of? But, uh, <laughs> oh, well, probably not. Uh, <laughs> and they find <laughs> similar. Do you know, I similar. hadn't even thought of that pun until now. <laughs> like, yeah, like, the way that he beautiful. says it, yeah. I think I think <laughs> Moist knows it when he says it too. He's definitely not an old rubber. Bar. He sort of says it hesitantly, uh, but they and they find some odd ledgers in there. But that that doesn't help them find Mister Bent. But while they're having dinner, Moist suddenly goes, "Wait, I know where Mister Bent will be. If he's upset, if things have gone wrong, what's the one thing he believes is pure and strong and of worth in this world? It's gold. He's going to be in the bank vault." And he goes down to look in the vault, and he can see through the little viewing port. Yeah, he is in there, but he's locked it from the inside, and he's got the only set of keys, so we can't get in. And this is where he has to, like, sort of use Gladys's newfound understanding of etiquette to sort of say, we need to mm. break into the bank vault. You're strong enough. And she's like, I don't think that's a good idea. And he's like, but there'll be a dead body on the premises. And she says, oh, well, that would be untidy. <laughs> that's kind of how he <laughs> convinces her to do it. It counts as moving the furniture as well. Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah, we need to clean under the furniture. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so good. 
Anyway, so she rips open a hole into the bank vault. Moist jumps down. And this is where the out-of-duty watchman, which has previously been established, um, watch over the bank and which Moist has avoided. There's a great video game style reference where when he's prowling around the bank at night, there's a bit where he says, sometimes when they're up on the upper levels, there were places where they could see you down through the um, grates. And I'm like, this is... Terry Pratchett played a lot of Thief the Dark Project and it shows in this scene. (laughs) The watchmen all sort of pop up out of the shadows and they're like, excuse me, sir, are you breaking into the bank vault? He goes, yeah, well, it's my bank. I'm the chairman and I didn't have the keys. And they're like, okay, but we're going to have to investigate this. This is all a bit suspicious. And then it gets more suspicious when they look into it and they realize that there actually is no gold in the vault. It's all fake. Just as the glooper said. Just as the glooper said. And it turns out it's previously been embezzled. It's been taken out of the bank by members of the lavish family. It's been turned into rings and sold off for other stuff. And they've just pretended the gold was still there by having, I think they say it's like lead wrapped in gold leaf or something. I can't remember. But they've pretended the gold is still in the bank and it's not. And Mr. Bent knows this because the previous chairman got him to cook the books and cover up all of the deals that they were doing selling the gold off incredibly cruel thing to do to someone who the two things he loves are gold and accurate figures so that's like one of the worst tortures you could inflict on him yeah and i I think the thing for me was when that came out that he'd done that i was like how did his faith in banking with a gold standard survive that experience i would have thought that would destroy your confidence in the whole system if it was going to be abused that way and The whole idea was that, yes, there's gold and it works on the promise of gold, the idea of gold, but there's no actual gold. Whereas he still talked like he believed in the actual gold being important. I think his attitude, like, from other experiences in his life is to pretend it hadn't happened. He's just, like, he probably has just put that somewhere in his brain. He's like, this gold is still there. The numbers still add up. I didn't do that. That's fine. We're just not going to think about it. We'll just spackle around. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Like, he's he's had this whole... His, most of his lifetime he's been repressing this thing, pretend like ab- adamantly believing he is not this thing that some part of him knows he actually is. So why not also adamantly it's insist that the gold is there, the gold is real, the figures are correct, I'm going to lock this down in my head and not let it out until obviously it all comes unraveled. And- it's a tiny mm. crack. And there's a little, yes, exactly, a little fissure and it opens. Yeah, because he's sent home to rest and Miss Drapes goes with him to look after him. And Cosmo by now has sort of put all the pieces together that he needs. So he's he's found out that, you know, Mr. Mister Bent has given him this information. He's gone and found Cribbins, who's told him about Moist's past as Albert Spangler. And he's sort of paid Cribbins off with a small amount of money, but like a promise of more money later. And also knowing the truth about the gold in the bank, he has launched a surprise audit at this moment, hoping to oust Moist. And it all comes to a real head and there's a hearing where they're like, okay, well, what's going on in this bank? We need to know the truth. And it happens at the palace and a lot of the stuff comes out. I mean, it's not a trial, but it's basically a trial scene, right? Like it's the way that it's written. And there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on at the same time, but a lot of the story comes out through this hearing. But one of the things that happens is the golems arrive from um. And the thing that has been happening in the background is the dead wizard, Professor Fleed, who's been summoned by the Department of Postmortem Communications, who's the only one who speaks the language. Lecherous old man, TM. Yeah, yeah. But he's worked out that gold doesn't just mean gold, literally, because gold was kind of their thing in the city of Arm. It can also mean like a multiplier. In this case, it's not four gold golems. It's 4,000 golems. <laughs> And they turn up in the city and most of them are like humanoid golems, but a lot of them are horses as well. And they're very old fashioned, like they don't have a bit of paper in their head. Their instructions are kind of baked into the clay, but they turn up in the city and they just kind of stop and no one can really order them to do anything, not even the other golems. So that's happened. And then at the hearing, they go through a bunch of stuff. Just confirming that they're not made of gold, though, right? They're, there's, they're 4,000 golems, but they're just made of exquisitely carved clay because they're like the first ones that were made beautifully in the image of man, all of that kind of thing, but large. And so they're not also golden. They're just very beautiful and very functional and lots of them. Yeah, that's true. That was sometimes a bit ambiguous, the way that they were talked about, because before they arrive, it's so built up that they're going to be made of gold because they had so much gold in the city of Um. But then they're not. 
I did like it as a metaphor throughout the book, though, even though it does turn out that they're not actually physically gold, but as this sort of looming, this idea of it's getting closer, it's close, getting closer, it's going to kind of come to some crisis point with mm. this this idea that gold is kind of encroaching on the city. Mm. Yeah. And there's also the, the idea that this is an international incident, right? Because other places have seen these golems march from somewhere, and there's 4,000 of them, each one of which is like the equivalent of a siege weapon, and they all have come to Ankh-Morpork. And so Ankh-Morpork's like, uh, are people going to think we're gearing up for war? Like, this is, <laughs> this is a bad news for us. So this is also part of the pressure that leads to this hearing, where we've got to, like, establish what is going on. So what ends up happening is there's a bit of back and forth. Cosmo, who who's poisoning from the ring, has just about driven him right over the edge. He thinks that this is all going to work out. It's not. Moist kind of takes advantage of the situation. He learns a few words of Omnian from the dead Professor Fleed and goes and talks to one of the golems, which does what he says when no one else has been able to get them to do anything. And he orders them to go outside the city and dig themselves into a hole and then comes back to the hearing. And slowly the truth comes out about the embezzlement, partly because it gets mentioned and Pucci can't keep her mouth shut about, (laughs) well, everyone does it. Like, we just take some of our own gold out of our own bank. And all the other bankers are like, oh, no. (laughs) And there's those great footnotes where the lawyers all stand up and it's how much money it costs them every time they open their mouth. But also the thing that really clinches it is the re-arrival of Mr. Bent, who had decided that he just has to go back to his own ways and he opens his um, wardrobe with the magic words, here we are again. (laughs) We find out that he was a clown, a born clown, which is, I mean, there's a whole school of fools, right? There's There's the Fool's Guild who eventually kind of take him in at the end of the book. But he's just born as a clown because his father was a traveling clown. Seemed a bit weird, but I I went with it because it was so funny. (laughs) That's why his timing is so good. He always knows what the time is. Isn't that the whole thing? Because he comes in, he comes in with his ladder and he like traps a whole bunch of people. He throws pies strategically and Moist gets one in the face trying to save veterinary from that because he knows that oh i just saw that in slow motion it was so good real bodyguard kind of because he knows that the the power would not survive if he had a face full of custard or whatnot and then he does the whole thing Mm. with the pineapple and they make the joke later about how newspaper comics aren't funny because he is being drawn with the pie but later on when um mr bent is taken off by white face to the clowns guild he's just like we lost a king amongst our craft because he was just beautifully done his timing was amazing he trapped all the like that's some prime battle clowning which i was like why, why didn't we get yeah. a book about battle clowning? Like, is there a whole subset of this? <laughs> and it sort of all clicked yeah. into place later for me that his, like, the reason he always knows the time, the reason that he's so good with numbers is because to be so precise in all of, like, humor, you have to have good timing. And he's got that at yeah. his very core. Just beautifully done. Yeah, I love that it all came down to he's got an exquisite sense of timing. But also, because, you know, his mother dies, who had raised mm. him, just no funny stuff because, you know, your father was a clown and he ran out on me. But then when his mother dies, his dad comes back for him, takes him back to the circus and says, you're going to be great. You can perform. You're born to it. You're so good. And then the first time he performs, he's not ready for the fact that the audience laughs at him. And he's like, I hate this. And he leaves. He runs away uh, and eventually <laughs> gets taken in by a band of traveling accountants <laughs> where he also has a, an amazing eye for numbers. So he's really good. He's got great comic timing, but he also just is, you know, like a mathematical savant. He just really gets numbers as well. It's also a nice little play on um, comedy as a serious business, right? I mean, as the, as the, as the Fool's Guild is in Discworld, but I mean, this this character in particular has no sense of humour. It's all straight up and down, right? Precision and correctness and stuff. It's just that at the same time, that is the basis for clowning. Mm. Yeah, it's certainly how the Fool's Guild approaches it. And I love that at the end, he kind of integrates those two parts of his personality, sort of, and that he goes back to wearing the suit and he goes back to working at the bank, but he's wearing the red nose and he's going to marry Miss Drapes and uh, he's offered like a, a raise to keep working there. Because he's famous, you know, that's the other thing we didn't mention is that, you know, if you got a job at the Royal Bank under Mr. Bent, people would describe you as Bent trained and they knew you knew what you were doing and you could have a job in any bank. And yeah, he's not throwing that away. He's He's going back to it, which is nice. But the plot comes to a head. That all comes out. The lavishes are done. There's going to have to be an inquiry. The bank's going to have to be shut down as they investigate this embezzlement. And they're probably going to investigate the other banks too because Poochie can't keep her mouth shut about how everybody does this. And Cosmo kind of loses it and draws his fake veterinary sword (laughs) on Moist. 
that's where Moist notices the whole thing with the ring and also realizes what's been going on with Cosmo this whole time and calls him Vetinari, which is enough for him to sort of gently lead him outside. He's taken the glove off. And so the Stygium ring goes into the sunlight and explodes, which we later find out surgically removes his finger and probably saves his life from being poisoned. It's not clear if it's poisoning from the ring itself or if it's just that the ring is cutting off the circulation to his finger so much that he's being poisoned by gangrene. <laughs> but it's gross either way. I, I was picturing it gangrene. Like, yeah, but also, like, veterinary doesn't, you know, doesn't wear his ring all the time, but I think it's gangrene. Well, he never, he never wears his ring because he only uses a signet. He keeps it in a box. Don't you put it on to do the signet ring part, though? Oh, yeah, that's true. He does wear it to use it, yeah. But that kind of ties up the plot. The one thing that you sort of then find out at the end is, you know, how did Moist command these golems? Well, he just figured out that, you know, I wear a gold suit, and these are golems from the city of Um, who famously had lots of gold. And turns out the golems aren't made of gold, but I reckon their priests probably wore gold, because gold was very important to them. So if I learn the right words and I command them, they'll listen to me because I'm wearing gold. And he does a deal. He does a sort of weird three-way deal with the professors from the university. So the dead professor, the deal he does with him is like, okay, if you teach me these words, I'll get the other professor to insorcise you into a strip club because he's a very lecherous wizard, which is a very weird combo on the disc world, but it, they kind of make it work. And so he's happy because he becomes a ghost, essentially haunting one of the seats in the pink pussycat club forever. And they do very well unless anyone tries to sit in that seat, um, which does not go well. But then he also does the deal with like the professor who runs the department saying, you know, this guy's undead. He's going to be over you forever. Like, what if you do this to get rid of him? I know just the place. It's not clear what there's part of that deal that didn't quite work for me, but it kind of all worked out in the end, I guess. I don't know. It was a bit weird. Which was the part that didn't really work for you? I think it was the way that Moist was negotiating with both of them and it wasn't clear what- it was clear what kind of what everyone was getting out of it, but it wasn't clear why they needed Moist. Oh, they couldn't figure it out on their own because, like, if one of them, if, like, the one who was still alive said to the other one, oh, we'll do this thing, he'd be like, you're just trying to get rid of me out of my, like, department, which I'm still, like, sort of head of. And, like, so they kind of needed a middleman to sort of sort it out for them. And I also don't think that they're creative enough to come up with this as a solution. Okay, that's fair. He's the ideas man. He's he's the middleman, which I guess is very moist, isn't it? So that makes sense. And the, yeah, the guy who convinces everyone to do the thing, he makes them think that that's the thing that they want to do, and mm. then actually it's the thing that helps him out. Yeah. Mm. But it did work for all of them, so great. <laughs> yeah. But that kind of resolves the plot. The bank is now kind of being controlled by Vetinari because he's had to seize it because of all of the corruption that he's got to investigate. The paper banknotes are going into circulation. Alswick Jenkins is given an angel by Vetinari and now works for the government under another name. But, you know, the way Vetinari sort of says, no, he was hanged. But I do know someone who uh, has very similar skills, <laughs> who if you need someone to design the rest of your banknotes, I can sort that out. And so it all kind of wraps up nicely. Uh, and there's that epilogue of what happens to Cosmo afterwards, which is he gets sent to a special hospital full of people who all think they are Lord Veterinary. <laughs> and he's like, hmm, good. That's the perfect place. No one will ever think to look for me, the real Lord Veterinary here. <laughs> That's very funny. When they basically decide that we don't need gold, we can have golems to, like, mm. stabilise the economy. I did enjoy that veterinary's plan before this because everyone was sort of agitating for war or for doing this kind of thing like all the like the heads were at the palace doing this thing he's like he already had his plan to get all the subcommittees going to make sure that nothing ever went anywhere which is like his go-to <laughs> right. thing but i love that it tied off so beautifully and then you have hubert in the basement with the glooper being like you know what this this man's been so nice to us like moist one lip and he's been in so much trouble because of the the gold being missing from the vault. Since I can fix that, let's let's just like fill up this flask of it. And at that moment, Moist and Adora Bell, I think, are there, and suddenly little flecks of gold start appearing, and it, then it sort <laughs> of raining down. is left there. <laughs> that was very funny. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah you, you, yeah, that was great. And then he disconnects it so that it won't be able to do that anymore. But that's like the one thing he's going to change is just undo this injustice. I did kind of skip over the bit where, yes, they shift from the idea of a gold standard because Moist repeatedly says that the value, you know, in the bank is the city itself. It's the labor that happens in the city. And now it's going to be represented by the labor of these golems, most of which have been buried so that they don't actually get used and replace human labor and sort of devalue the amount people get paid for human labor. 
but some of which are going to be used by the post office and some of which are going to be used to power the clax system mm. there is a very i think it's a very kind of subtle thread to the book that about like the value of the city being labor um and the labor of people can i can i talk about my favorite joke which is actually back a bit but mm. it does go right to this stuff which is one of those ones that the which i this is one of the things i love about terry pratchett is that the more you learn about other things like the world history everything the more jokes you find yeah when um bent has made a mistake and he's gone off they don't know where he is and all the clerks are like oh well you know a reference from mr bent is like incredible if you're bent trained that's a really important thing one of them goes i hear all they're all working for a human resources manager at pipeworths bank now and if it comes to that i'll take mr bent any day of the week at least he thinks i'm a person i was hearing where she was timing how long people spent in the privy mm. and then moist goes they call it a time and motion study <laughs> which which is a poo joke obviously like it's, a, it's, a to- it's toilet humor but if you know anything about taylorism it's actually a joke about the foundations of management theory. So Frederick Taylor started time and motion studies. He timed workers lifting pig iron and how long it took them to take it from one side of the building to the other and used that as a basis for efficiency. So basically it was this awful, awful process whereby workers were just timed and made to move faster and faster and faster to the point where it was completely awful to do the work. I mean, it was awful anyway, but they were, you know, keeping it slow so that they could actually like have some life and not, you know, exhaust themselves during the day or whatever. But Taylor was like, no, no, we have to move faster. They have to work harder. We have to make more money. So this is beautiful little, like this, all of this history about like this labor history and, and management theory. And Taylor was awful, like a psycho and management theory is awful. And the workers hated it for obvious reasons. But like all of that is just like encapsulated in this tiny little dirty joke yeah. <laughs> in this little part of this book. And I just thought when I, when I saw that, I was like, this is beautiful. A plus. Yeah. Gold star. And also just a reminder Mm -hmm. too that, you know, again, this book was 2007, so it's quite a while ago now, but it's got reference to employers putting constraints on how long you can spend on bathroom breaks. Oh, yeah, we've been dealing with that for like two decades like or more, like Mm. this kind of crazy control over or or much longer, of course, (laughs) if we go all the way back to the origin of the joke, as you explained. But yeah, I just, there's a lot of stuff in this book particularly like and uh, it's interesting because a few of the more recent ones we've read have felt very relevant even you know nearly 20 years after they were written and i think that's an interesting commentary not just on pratchett's writing but also on what's happening with our culture and society at the moment well what's not happening yeah and these are perennial problems right like it might seem weird to talk about somebody in the 19th century timing workers picking up giant slabs of iron has nothing to do with how we work today in an office. But I think what he kind of does in this book is sort of collapse the the space, Mm. right? Like actually these are, these are all related. The issues might look slightly different, but they're the same today, right? How we create value is still a very live question and one that workers and managers are constantly kind of butting heads about. Mm. Yeah, and I don't think it's it's an accident that where Ankh-Morpork kind of ends up is very sort of, you know, industrial revolution kind of age where a lot of the problems that we still are dealing with today are born, which is a different kind of place to a lot of fantasy, which still adheres to a sort of much more medieval or sometimes Renaissance kind of model of history where things are a bit different. You know, like the feudal system doesn't really directly map onto our modern. I mean, it's clearly a precursor and there are elements, but this is different. You know, the power in Ankh-Morpork is not from hereditary kings and lords. It's from capitalists and people who have the money. Um, and that's because of, you know, the point of its own history that it's in. Are there any other favorite bits that we want to bring up before we get into some listener questions? I think some of the listener questions include questions about the dog's favorite new toy. So um, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that for sure. Um, <laughs> There's two, it's, it's a book of favorite bits for me. Like I can't really pick them out. I've been bringing them up as I, I go along, I think. Oh, yeah. It's a book that's very dense with jokes, right? Like there's a pun in almost every line. He doesn't let a paragraph go by without a swipe at something, um, which I know how I was saying to you guys before we started recording, but um, I haven't read a Terry Pratchett book for a while. Not, I, I don't think the last time I read one was the last time I was on the show, but it wasn't, at least not this year, I haven't read a Terry Pratchett book. And so coming back to it after reading a lot of like other kinds of literature, mm-hmm. it was um, surprising to see just how many damn jokes there yeah. were. And, and delightful, obviously. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I look, I had the same problem. There's so many, so many jokes. I will just do a shout out that there are a lot of little cultural reference jokes as well. Like there's a, there's, um, my favorite one is probably 
early on when Hubert's explaining the glooper, he sort of talks about how this vial represents all the money stuffed under mattresses. And Moist says something like, oh, that's a lot of mattresses. And Hubert says, oh, I prefer to think of it as one mattress, like three miles high. And this, I think, is a clear reference to the joke about the Twinkie in Ghostbusters when they're using a Twinkie as a representation of the normal amount of supernatural energy in New York. And at the moment, it would be a Twinkie, like three miles wide, and however big it is. So I thought that there's a lot of those little pop culture things in here as well. So as well as history, you know, Pratchett was a nerd. So there's like a Ghostbusters reference. There's a Jaws reference. Moist at one point says, we're going to need some bigger notes. There's uh, <laughs> there's the fatal attraction bit with Gladys because Gladys develops a crush on Moist. And then when Adora Bell comes back, she gets quite jealous. And there's a point where Mr. Fusspot has gone missing and Gladys is cooking the dinner. And Adora Bell goes, I need to see what's in the dinner, Gladys. And you're like, okay, this is clearly a reference to that bit in Fatal Attraction where the character kills the other character's pet rabbit it was i i don't that felt a bit off but also i was like oh i'm so glad that you didn't actually go there because gladys did not do it but i i kind of knew that was going to be the case because there's no way terry pratchett was going to kill mr fusspot no earthly way (laughs) oh but you fear it like in that moment um that's a, it's a really good scene. Yeah. Like he, yes, it's so well it's done. It's because Adora Bell believes it. Because she has such a, a link to the golems, you know, and has such faith and trust in them and vice versa. The fact that she suspects it's happened and not moist means you go, oh, well, this is a possibility. So, there was a moment where I was like, oh, maybe it is happening, but they're going to save Mr. Like, uh, Mr. Fussball's definitely not going to die. But is he in danger? Maybe he is. But no. And I was so pleased when it was all just a misunderstanding. But yeah, so there's there's so many good things, so many good things in this. I was looking through my very um, intricate filing system of taking photos of pages that have quotes that I like on them, and the one that I want to share comes back to my pet thing of the arts being looked down upon, and it's during the Cabinet of Curiosities section where they're at the university and Adora Bell shows Ponder an arm that they found of one of the golems during this dig and says, oh, the markings are the same as the foot that's in the Cabinet of Curiosity. And then Ponder says, the art's not my field, he added, in a way that suggested his was a pretty superior field with much better flowers in it. You need Professor Fleed. And I love that necromancy is apparently the arts. Yeah, the dark arts. There's a great, oh, there's some great <laughs> puns around that as well. Even in the chapter heading, there's something about the fine dark arts or the dark fine arts is one of the phrases that they use. And then there's also the fact that the necromancer guy is also an amateur actor. <laughs> And Moist spots this and knows exactly what to say to get him on side. And I thought, that's so accurate. Oh, my God. But, yeah, that was great. Oh, you know what we haven't even mentioned? I'll just quickly get this in because it's important, is that Cribbins has got these horrendous old secondhand false teeth with springs in them that cause him problems Mm. throughout the plot. And one of the last thing that happens in the book is that after they've kind of dealt with all the other stuff, Cribbins has kind of been forgotten and then appears out of the shadows and gets a knife to Adora Bell's throat because he's like, you're going to give me lots of money or I'm going to kill her because Moist has come clean during the hearing. That's one of the ways he gets away with it is he just tells everyone, yeah, I was a con man. And Vetinari backs up this story and goes, yeah, he was. And I pardoned him basically and gave him a new life and he's look what he's done for us with the post office. It was all worth it. Uh, and that kind of works. But Cribbins is incensed about this because it means his plan to expose him and get money is, is gone. So he threatens Adora Bell. And earlier in the book, Moist clocks that, you know what, Anoya kind of owes me one, the goddess of things stuck in drawers, because she was nobody. And then I did my whole thing of pretending to pray to the gods so I could find some money. And one of the gods I prayed to was Anoya, who at the time no one really thought of or knew anything about. And she has gone up in the world since then, let me tell you. So she kind of owes me one. And if you want to pay me back any time now would be the time. And nothing happens out of that for quite a while until right at the end, uh, (laughs) as he's like sort of threatening a doorbell, uh, the springs go out of the horrible false teeth and basically incapacitate Cribbins. And there's some thought that maybe that's Anoya paying Moist back by influencing things that get stuck in drawers. Did he die? Like, I, in my head, he died, like, from springs just going through his head. Um, the way that they drag him off kind of indicates that he's still alive. Okay. But horribly injured. But praise be to Anoya, well done. Yeah. But I, in my head, I remembered this as Moist praying to Anoya in the moment and then her answering, but that's not how it happened in the book. It's interesting when we come back to books that I haven't read for like 20 years that I'm like, or 15 years in this case, I have these memories of some of the stuff that happens that's quite different to the reality of the book. This book isn't 15 years old. It just came out. (laughs) 
Yeah, I know. It's more than that. It's like 18 years old. Don't say that. It can vote. Are you joking? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Speaking of questions, no. (laughs) Yeah, no, speaking of questions, we should get on to some of our listener questions because we got sent some great ones for this episode. All right. So our first question comes from Ian Nichols via Facebook. The servant is a golem called Gladys, made of clay. Do you think Terry was a fan of The Goon Show, who had a maid called Gladys, always played on the radio by a man with a gravelly voice? Even if it's a coincidence, it amuses me. 100% not a coincidence. Yeah. Like, absolutely not a coincidence. No way. There is zero chance that young Terry Pratchett did not listen to The Goon Show. <laughs> like, mm. Come on. Yeah. So I'm just going to acknowledge that Peter Anderson via Facebook had asked what conclusions did we jump to about the backstory of Bent, which I think we covered during the episode. So I'll move on to the next question, which comes from Chris via Twitter. Some people focus on the technical aspects of money. Is it or is it not backed by gold? What is the inflation rate? How does the central bank work? Pratchett focused on the reality distortion field, so social aspect, which I think is very important in real money. Do you agree? I think, yeah. 100%. Like, I don't think you could read this book and understand the basis of modern banking. (laughs) Like, the understanding we get is like Moist's level when he's talking to Bent. A dollar represents a promise to give you a dollar's worth of gold. And Bent kind of says, yeah, that's basically true. We promise to uphold that promise as long as you don't actually ask us to give you the gold. (laughs) This is kind of the way that they explain it. And I don't think they get a lot deeper than that, except when they talk about if you're not measuring worth with gold. How do you measure it? And that's where they get into questions about labor and golems and and the people in the city. I'm not sure if this is the reality distortion field exactly, but I think he kind of, what Pratchett does in this one is he, he's touching on the unspoken social contract we make when it comes to things like value and currency, right? Like, yes, there's a social aspect. When I looked up reality distortion field, which wasn't a phrase I had come across in this context before, I learned that it came from Steve Jobs. Huh. Like, like, encouraging people to believe in something being possible when they previously didn't believe that it was possible, sort of pushing the bounds of possibility by pushing people's belief in what was possible, which having watched Top Gun Maverick last night, is that's what I first thought <laughs> of, <laughs> which is exactly what happens in that film. And I think in some ways that is sort of what Moist is doing throughout this is he's kind of encouraging people's belief in a, in a direction in order to make the practice able to happen. More at the heart of the book is that sort of, agreed understanding that we sort of have in society about how things work and what's okay and what's not okay for better and worse right like Pucci's sort of but everyone does that everyone spends their own money out of their own bank secretly etc like that's just the way it is I mean that kind of assumption that that's the way it is for one class of people is different to the assumptions made by other classes of people Uh, it's a little bit of a sidetrack but that's what I thought of when I was looking at that question I think like when I first read this book it made me understand a lot more about money that I had not because like I read it, I guess, 18 years ago, and I had never really interrogated it because it's just something that's around, that is in society, that's just a pillar of it. I remember at the time being like, oh, I get a lot more about how it all works. I never really thought about there having to be something to tether it for money to mean something outside of it. Because you, I think as a kid, you go, well, why can't they just print more money and then everyone will have money? Like, why doesn't that just work? And I got a lot of it that way. But I think the thing now that I find hard to deal with, even though I know, I think less actually, like the older you get, the more things you find out, the less tangible things are. And I find that something difficult to grasp sometimes because the idea that money is really a social contract, which this book illustrates in a lot of different ways, is hard to get my head around and also keep my head around, if that makes sense. Because you do sort of slip into the bent way of thinking, being like, no, no, it has to be numbers. It has to be tethered to a thing. There's something there, it's all real, but the fact that it is essentially a social contract, it's an agreement and it could just all change, that's hard to hold on to and understand for me. And I could have that all wrong because I don't pretend to fully understand how economics and currency works, but every time I read a book like this or I read a book that's about cryptocurrency or something like that, the harder I find it to belief that it all keeps chugging along because so much of it is like what if or maybe this or since we all believe that like there's a wikiality to all of it that is just hard to accept and something so crucial to society i'm not sure if that answers the question i was just my mind is blown by how this thing is so flimsy yeah for me i think it, it kind of 
the scene that kind of best sums it up is the bit where Moist is testing the banknotes out with just regular people on the street. And they talk about it and they're like, this is like an IOU. No, but the IOU is the money. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So who owes it to him? He owes it to you. Yeah. And they, they sort of go, all right. So this is all right. Whereas, you know, some people in 2024 will be like, what's physical money? But, <laughs> you know, for those who grew up with physical money, we're used to the idea that some money is coinage and some money is, is notes. It's not a radical concept. But even then, there's that moment where Moist thinks, oh, yeah, this is going to work. Great, great, great. And then they go, but there'll still be some gold in the bank, right? <laughs> and you're like, he's, and he's yeah. just so disappointed. He's like, no, we, we just had the discussion that it doesn't matter. Like the, the note is a representation of worth that you're passing between each other as a marker. Like it doesn't matter. There doesn't need to be gold somewhere else. And it's an illustration. I think what you were just saying, Liz, that the concept of money can be difficult to sort of really pin down and interrogate when we're so used to it just being part of our daily lives. In year 12, and I did accounting as a subject, when we had goodwill was something that you could put a monetary figure on and do it through accounts. And that blew my mind as well, because I was like, goodwill is a nice thing, but the idea that you can tie like a set number to it doesn't make sense to me, but it does at the same time. But numbers are supposed to be set, reliable, but yeah, tying a number to something intangible, which is what we do all the time. Like, how do you decide what an intangible thing is worth? How do you decide what a painting is worth? What a piece of paper is worth? Like all that kind of stuff. Anyway, yeah. let's move on to the next question. Um, this one comes from Rebecca Johnson via Facebook. So a bit of a whimsical question. Who, real or imagined, would you leave your bank owning dog to if you had to, assuming that there'd be a hit out on them by unscrupulous characters? Ooh, that's a, oh, it's a tough a question. One. I, I mean, mean, John Wick. I'm gonna yeah, just... John Wick. He's got form <laughs> yes. for protecting, although he also has let a few dogs die. So John John Wick, like in the second movie, John Wick. Okay, yep. No, that's fair. Actually, I don't think you. I don't. I don't think I can do better than that. <laughs> no, I'm so, no, no. That let's, dog's let's not go going that. anywhere. Anyone who th- looks at that yeah. dog weird is dead. They're dead. <laughs> I'd read the heck out of that book, though. That'd be amazing. All right. So next question comes from Jewel E via Facebook. Moist made a commitment that the outworkers can use their skills on commemorative coins. The Royal Australian Mint for 2024 Book Week released a coloured, uncirculated 20 cent coin with Where is the Green Sheep? Which book would you celebrate in coin form? Oh, and there's also been that thing recently where uh, they crashed one of the websites because they had a bluey. The um, bluey coins. Oh, and yeah. the guy stole a b- bunch the of the blue coins, coins. Which really? I, I was like, why I are there no headlines being like, What a dog act? Or like, Bandit at work. Bandit? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, and oh, just to add on to that, um, We Met Arthur from Knowledge Anxieties had a similar question. If you could choose someone's head to be on a banknote, who would it be and what landmarks and what would it say? Okay. So what book would we put on our commemorative coins and who would we put on our paper money? Yep. It's a good question. My first idea for the commemorative coin I actually realized has been on stamps before, oh. which is Graham Bass, um, his beautiful illustrated books. Um, especially for a banknote, I was thinking like um, The Sign of the Seahorse is one that I remember reading when I was a kid. Beautifully intricate paintings. I think Animalia has been on on stamps. I did look that up, had some memory of that, and I did find that. And the other one I thought was um, Alison Lester, um, her her books, My Farm, maybe. like it's it, They're not as complicated for banknotes, obviously, but they're kind of, you know, it's beautiful countryside, families, horses, chickens, that kind of thing. That's nice. Hmm. I don't know if it's just because I'm really into the Rings of Power TV show at the moment, but I feel like the, the, there's a lot of good Lord of the Rings ones you could do. Like you could have the White Tree of Gondor on a coin. You could have, the, I mean, you wouldn't put the Eye of Sauron on a coin. Oh, you, you would. Could. It'd you be could. great. It would be evil and you'd have to cast <laughs> it into the fire. <laughs> but yeah, it could be fun. You could do one on each side and then you could flip it. Am I going to be evil or good today? Uh, oh, and actually that they could do a Batman coin that is like the one that, um, Two Face flips, which would have to be double headed, but one would have big scars in it. Like my puckish nature was like, it would have to be like a book that is very anti currency because that would be funny. But in terms of a book that I would like to celebrate because I love it, I would I'd quite like a Howl's Moving Castle coin series. I think that would be quite beautiful. And there's enough characters that you could do like a whole set of them, which would be very nice. Oh, I could, yeah, you could have one with Calcifer on it. Yeah. So, um, if you had to choose someone's head to be on a banknote, who would it be? And so, like, paper money. How would your paper money look? Hmm. The Very Hungry Caterpillar would be good on a banknote. It would also take up 
space on a banknote in a way that wouldn't be able to do on a coin. I've been thinking about this because the one commemorative coin set that I ever was like, I wish I had known about that in advance and I could have got some was the Australian Mint did do the anniversary of Mr. Squiggle. And they did like a set of coins with the Mr. Squiggle uh, characters. And I think I did manage to get one, but I really wanted the Bill Steam Shovel one. And I didn't get that one because he's my favorite. But I feel like Mr. Squiggle's head on a banknote would work because he's got such a long pencil nose that it wouldn't really fit on a coin. But you could, I can just imagine the banknote with his head at one end and the pencil nose slightly longer than in real life going all the way to the other end with a squiggle at the end of it that he's drawn as if he's drawn it on the banknote. I think that would be a great banknote because everyone loves Mr. Squiggle. He's not controversial. I think that leads very nicely into the next question, which comes from Queeve McDonald via Twitter. The same with the dog and the inappropriate toy is one of my all-time favorite jokes. Is it also Sir Terry Pratchett's most risque joke? Hope you enjoyed that segue. I'm sorry, Mr. Squiggle fans. Is it? I don't, I mean, he's, there's a lot of like risque jokes in this one, but I mean, the Natty Og often comes mm, out with some yeah. dirty I, stuff. Yeah. I think the scene in Masquerade where Nanny Ogg's made the dessert, which gets everybody horny, basically, and everyone's like sort of hiding their boners under the table, <laughs> if I can describe it crudely. <laughs> I think that is his dirtiest scene. And I think it's great. I think it's very funny. And I love it. But I also just want to question, and Queef, like, I love this question, by the way. How risque is, I mean, you know, there's a sex toy in public being played with by a dog. But is that really that risque? I feel like it's more about our shame about other people's sexual proclivities, right? Like it's not people being sexual. It's an item associated with sexuality in another context, which is a different kind of joke to the kind of thing that I normally think of as risque humor. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's kind of bawdy, right? Like it's- Yeah. I mean, a lot of his a lot of his jokes around sex are very bawdy. They're very kind of English in that way, in my opinion. He does kind of border on risque, I think, as well in this a bit. Mm. Oh yeah, well, there's a lot of the innuendo with the Professor Fleet. Mm. That's true. The, I agree that it's not quite risque, but it is also hilarious. The image, like, there's a serious scene, and then there's this dog that, because of the vibrations of the toys being like <laughs> flipped and like rocketed around, I'm like. <laughs> Well, this was like a serious piece of equipment that Joshua had. <laughs> that is, hang on, I could read it. That is, that is the ultimate one. There's several great moments. This, here's the paragraph. It was at this point that Moist became aware of a regrettably familiar whirring sound. And from his raised position, he was the first to see the chairman of the Royal Bank appear from behind the curtains at the far end of the hall with his wonderful new toy clamped firmly in his mouth. Some trick of the vibrations was propelling Mr. Fusspot backwards across the shiny marble. <laughs> People in the audience craned their necks as, with tail wagging, the little dog passed behind Veterinary's chair and disappeared behind the curtains on the opposite side. <laughs> it was very, it's very funny. And that's it. That's the whole bit. But it's so, such a good image. Oh. Uh, yeah. It's, it does stick with you. I'm not sure if that's, like, a great thing to be, like, something reminds you of that and you're out in the world and you're like... Tch. But very, very funny. Um, yeah. I just like to give a nod to the um, mention earlier they made of the finger body horror. That comment came from Boris Woluzko via Twitter. Mm-hmm. But I'll move on to the next question, which comes from Sarah, the fat culture critic via Twitter. If you could design your own Ankh Morpork bill, what would it look like? And would it incorporate a motto? Just think, we recently went to the Discworld convention in Adelaide and there was a contest where you had to come up with a crest and have a motto. I didn't win. Ben was a judge, so I feel very robbed, but that's okay. Um, I'll get over it in time. I didn't know which one was yours. It was very fair. That makes it worse. But yeah, okay. <laughs> so, if you could design your own Ankh Morpork pill, what would it look like? And would you incorporate a motto? I mean, it's hard to improve on any of the mottos that Terry Pratchett wrote associated with the city. Like, we'll rule it for you wholesale is pretty good from the, the national anthem. And I feel like there's some vibe of that that would go on a banknote. Maybe something that makes the banknote sound fancy, but when you translate it, it actually just means I owe you 10 bucks, uh, you know, like something very simple like that, or, or some sort of legal disclaimer, because it would all be in Latation, which is kind of the dog Latin as a real language of the disc world. I think it'd be good to have the ank on it, like the, the river, oh, uh, yeah. with like detail of things bouncing on it. <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> 
this note won't bounce, unlike things on our river. Yeah, it looks like a beautiful, you know, river with a... And then when you look closer with the magnifying glass, it's got all kinds of things stuck in it. Dead bodies in it and stuff. Some feet, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. That's really good. What denomination would that be? Like 100? 50. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I reckon you put a hippo on one as well. Got to have a hippo because they're the heraldic animal of the city. And you have a hippo on, on one and you have a more pork on a different one. Mm. All right. Our next question comes from a chew and sneezed via Twitter. If you had the glooper, where would you put all the money? What a terrifying question. Oh. It's a great well, question. Well, I, mean, I mean, if we had a real glooper and it was connected to the real world, there'd just be like four massive tanks on one side of the room. <laughs> and then there'd be all these tiny, tiny little tanks that had almost nothing in them and could hardly fit anything. So I think you'd just empty the big one out so that all the other ones would get filled, right? It'd be a very quick way to redistribute <laughs> money, just tipping it out so that it sloshed around the room and filled up everybody else's cup. That would be my answer too, Ben. I yeah. think it's a good answer. I just got scared by the minutiae of all like the follow-on effects. Like once we've balanced everything out, I think after that it gets into the scary where do you put all the things yeah, but I mean, this is where you look at the economic reality of it and you go, look, if you give, if you, if you gave $10,000 to a million people, it wouldn't touch the sides of what all of the richest people in any given country have, or most countries have, but it would be life changing for those million people, right? Mm. If you give the, the million people with the least money $10,000, it would make a massive difference in their lives. Even just $10,000. I mean, I think about if someone gave me $10,000, the difference it would make in my life would be quite, enormous in some ways and i'm doing relatively okay you know so if you think about it in those terms then yeah spilling out one of those big tanks into all the small ones would be it's just a no brain we'd just be taxing the rich just do it right we'd yeah. just be taking yeah, the, top, the top of that and then you know we do a report on this all the time but like it wouldn't it doesn't actually take very much money to bring the people with the lowest incomes up to an okay living standard and it would it would be the the smallest amount off the top of of the top of the very wealthy um which they're not paying and they should be paying because they pay the least amount of yeah. tax so i mean that's and that would just be for starters right we mm. could do better than that yeah i think it's an excellent answer it's just magical proper taxation <laughs> <laughs> right all right, brilliant. Our next question comes from Dr. Cat Day via Twitter. What do you think about the fact that veterinary slash Pratchett put Moist in charge of the post and then hear the money later train slash transport and the idea that Moist would eventually take over everything and the possible parallels with Terry Pratchett's own life? It's an interesting trajectory and he changes tack. Like one of the other things that happens right at the end of this book is that veterinary is talking about how the next thing they need to reform, like we were just talking about, is the tax system. And maybe they could put Moist in charge of that because the current guy is like, old school thumb screws <laughs> kind of <laughs> kind of attitude. Uh, and he's like, we could do better. We can do better than that. Um, and uh, then he, and he, he had a whole plan and I think he, he, it's well known. He started writing the book. It was called Raising Taxes. And then he changed his mind and wanted to do the trains book instead, which became Raising Steam. So there's that. And I think it's such a good vehicle for him to be able to look at the institutions around him that mattered to him or that had an impact on him and, and people's lives and go, but why are they like that? And what if we put someone from outside that inner circle in charge? What would they change? How would they make it work? I think that's the impetus for it. And as we've talked about, like, it seems like the trajectory would be to end with democratic elections in Ankh Morpork, we're totally revitalizing how the system of government works and maybe Moist becoming not patrician, but the first prime minister of Ankh Morpork or whatever system they put in place. And we obviously never saw that, but that, that seems like the obvious trajectory. I think that's probably right. I wonder if it would have made the books a little more dull mm. to kind of get to that, right? Like there's some, cause so much of the fun of these ones is the process of change and the kind of stresses and the challenges of modernization. Um, and a lot of the Ankh Morpork books are kind of focused on that. And I do think that the closer it gets, like this one did surprise me about just how much it was about, about those bureaucratic processes. And, and I think it would probably make the stories less exciting if we got to that point in Pratchett novels. Mm. So I'm glad we kind of didn't. It'd be less fantasy, right? Like it mm. would, it would be more, we'd be closer to reality. Yeah. And the closer to reality it is, I think, the less fun it is. And as readers of the books got like that, would be kind of like moist in the post office at the beginning of this book. Like it's it's all running really nicely, but 
what are we doing? Exactly. Yeah, it would remove that sort of tension at the top of the city. There's also, there's very much a running theme through a lot of the Ankh Port books that democracy has been tried on the Discworld and it doesn't work. <laughs> Like that's, there's that whole thing that that's why we have a tyrant, which is interesting because it also, I think, speaks to something I've been thinking about and trying to figure out how to express about Pratchett's writing, which is that in many ways it's very progressive, but there are certainly other parts of it where he's very much writing in a way that can be interpreted in different ways by different people so as not to alienate segments of his potential audience. And one of those is, you know, he has these universal sort of sweeping statements about people are dumb, so democracy doesn't really work. And the only functional government in the disc world is an autocratic dictatorship, right? <laughs> With a benevolent dictator. And you're like, that is an essentially conservative idea. Whereas you wouldn't really describe Pratchett or a lot of the other things in his books as conservative. But yet, you know, he has this in the books, which means there's something for a conservative reader to look at and go, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. There's an interesting tension there, I think. As to how it parallels with Pratchett's life, I think that's an interesting question. I can't, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that. And I would love for you to tell us more because I'm not sure how. I think there's a, there's a parallel in, in the sense that Pratchett's writing about the things he's interested in and getting moist in a little bit as himself. He's sort of living out a few of his dreams. I don't think his dream was ever to run a bank, but maybe a post office and definitely a train system. <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean by that. So I don't know how to answer that one. Following on quite nicely from that question, there's one from Rin via Instagram. What else would you have liked to see Moist take on and would he have taken over for veterinary? So we've answered the second part, I think, unless there's anything anyone would like to add. Yeah, I think we've established we kind of want that government thing, the democracy thing to be teased maybe, but never actually happen. I mean, I agree with what you've said, but I'm not convinced that definitely he would have moved towards democracy because I'm not sure that veterinary believes that Ankh-Morpork society is there yet but not saying this is a model for our own society obviously but um in terms of veterinary's plans for succession i think if he wanted to have a benevolent dictator take over from him yes he has tapped moist as an option but he's also playing both sides so that if there was a vote he's popular enough that he'd probably also win Hmm. but what about other institutions we've already we've had post we've had banking we've had trains so public transport. Schools. Ooh. Yeah. Because, like, are there schools outside of, like, the guilds? There are. Yeah. Because remember, um, Susan worked at one. And um, there are also private governesses. But there's more of a public school system coming. So, it, or, well, it's not clear if there's a, there are public schools. There's sort of hints that maybe there are, but we never really see them. Like, in the Australian sense, not in the... British sense of public school, meaning private school. It always confuses me. But anyway, yeah, education system, that could be a really good one. I reckon he would do really well. I mean, he sort of does it a little bit in all these books, but I reckon he would do really well as a diplomat, international Mm. relations, Mm. stopping a – does he stop a giant war at one point? He kind of stopped one in this one, didn't he? Like, Yeah. But he's like – he's he's that smooth kind of – the smooth talker thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, he's a natural politician, right? Like – a politi- what's the difference between a politician and a swindler? <laughs> Who knows? And um, <laughs> that's kind of activated a memory Patreon. for me from going postal, which I'm hoping is a memory, not just something I've invented, where he has to go somewhere and drink vast amounts of alcohol to be trusted, but he has a special thing in his suit that like, he, the, the alcohol goes into his suit so he's not actually drinking it, so he doesn't get drunk, he just acts drunk, so then he can get the information he needs without actually being incapacitated in the way he seems. But I may just be injecting another book, on top of something else? I don't know. Mm, I don't remember that, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Yeah. If anyone does remember where that's from, um, please let me know. And if it hasn't, um, please don't <laughs> write a book about it because I'll then use it myself. <laughs> I'm also thinking public health because there are some private hospitals in Ankh-Morpork, Pork, but there's not there, – and there's the Lady Sybil Free Hospital, but that's kind of like a charity-run hospital. It's not like a government-run thing. And I wonder if public health care would be one. That could get fun. And I, also just because I love any excuse to get Dr. Lorne <laughs> into a book because he's a great character and he's in this one very briefly. But oh. yeah, I think that could be very cool. Plus, you know, the Igors that you'd get in that book would have just yeah. been magnificent. Mm. Yeah, medical Igors. That'd be amazing. Mm. All right. So the next question comes from Lachlan via Discord. Congratulations. Like Ankh Morpork, Melbourne has finally rejected fiat currency and wants to be backed by something like traditionally gold or now the golems. What should we back the new Melbourne currency with? Name for currency pending, but I suggest the shot. Alcohol or coffee meaning TBD. 
Black I mean, fabric. Oh, which could also be called the shot. Uh, or a bolt. Um, that's great. Yeah. Very good. You, can, you came up with that very quickly. That is... I thought about this before. <laughs> but also, it's... It just it sound, it's just right. <laughs> we are international city of literature. Is mm-hmm. there something book related? Could it be a book? And then instead of cents, you'd have pages. I don't know. I, I I don't know that that quite works. Or you could do like words, or I don't know. It's too high concept. <laughs> we can back our currency with rain in Melbourne, perhaps. <laughs> I think rain is a great suggestion from Liz. But unfortunately, I have to rain on our parade and tell you that we had some technical difficulties and I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut the episode a little short there because we didn't get everything that happened after that. But I do want to say a big thank you to Stephanie Convery for being a wonderful returning guest. It's always a joy to have her back on. Again, if we are still going in another 40 episodes, we'll have to have you back. Please check out her work as Inequality Reporter for The Guardian. We'll have a link to that in the episode notes. And you can still find her book, after the Count, the Death of Davy Brown, if you go looking, uh, it's definitely available as an ebook, and you might even be able to find it in print if you ask someone nicely to order it in for you. Also, thank you, of course, for listening and particularly for bearing with us as we needed to take a bit of a month off last month. It's been quite an epic time uh, and I'm going away. So I'm squeezing this edit in just before I go. Another thing I want to squeeze in before I go is some news from the world of Terry Pratchett and the Discworld. So there's a lot happening at the moment. First of all, we've just seen the publication of the paperback edition of A Stroke of the Pen, uh, that last collection of Pratchett's lost stories from newspapers in the 1970s. And the significant thing there is that it includes an extra story that was not in the previous editions. Uh, That story is going to be released online for free, probably already available. I haven't gone looking yet. Also happening in the near future, the Discworld role-playing game, the tabletop role-playing game, from Modifius is coming to Kickstarter. They've announced a date for it. It's on the 15th of October. They made a little video and they've released a free set of quick start rules. This is something that's very common in the world of role playing games. Before a game is fully released, they'll release this sort of free preview of the rules with enough rules so that you can try it out. Usually some pre-made characters, which this has, and a pre-made adventure, which this also has, uh, all set in Ankh-Morpork, because the game is subtitled Adventures in Ankh-Morpork, where you play members of the Ankh-Morpork City Watch. Not members from the books, I should say. They are new characters made for the game, because you get to make your own character in the game. Uh, but well worth checking out. There's some wonderful art of the new characters. I've had a quick flick through it. I'm going to read it more, and I will almost certainly have a lot more to say about that in the future. So check out the Discord role-playing game from Modifius. And also, if you're in Australia, something else you should be checking out, three Discworld plays that are coming up at various cities around the country. Um, not Melbourne, unfortunately. So sorry, Melbourne listeners. But if you are in Brisbane, the Brisbane Arts Theatre are doing The Fifth Elephant from the 19th of October. If you're in Adelaide, Sporadic Productions are doing Masquerade from the 30th of October. That's at the Holden Street Theatres. And in Perth, Rolling Stone Theatre are opening Guards Guards with an amazing looking detritus, by the way, uh, on the 22nd of November. Now, those all look like they're going to be a lot of fun. Three of our favourite books. Those three plays are opening soon, so do look them up. I'll try and get some details into the episode notes for you. Thank you once again for listening. Thank you to our subscribers for subscribing and making it possible for us to make this show. Uh, But look, uh, we will be back next month and we're going to continue our moist streak, if I can say that, with the Clax board game. Yes, we're going back to the board games. And this is the most recently produced board game in which you play Clax operators racing Moist Von Lipfig as he tries to take a message to Genua before you can send it via Clax. Uh, It's got lots of different game modes. Um, It's got sort of a logic puzzle at the heart of it, but it's also quite a a beautiful interpretation of how the Clax system works. I'm really looking forward to playing it and telling you all about it. That'll be our next episode. That's Pratchat81 is the hashtag if you want to send us questions via social media, or you can email us at chat at pratchatpodcast.com. Get your questions in. Thank you once again so much for listening for sending in questions, for subscribing, um, for just supporting us in general. And until next time, remember, it's just gold. Gold.
You've been listening to Pratt Chat, the monthly Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast with Pratt Chatter's Elizabeth Flux, Ben McKenzie, that's me, and guest Stephanie Convery. Pratt Chat is produced and edited by me on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Our music is by David Ashton. We're on social media as Pratt Chat or Pratt Chat Podcast, and you can listen to past episodes and support the production of new ones via prattchatpodcast.com. Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag Pratchat80. Pratchat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Doctor Who podcast Splendid Chaps and time travel comedy series Night Terrace. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.